can't well, try Ranger. I got to get around this. <laughs> we are glad to have you. And if you can, if you can't, it's okay. If you can put a number before your name, that just bumps you up oh. to the top. If not, I can just remember to search for you. All right. I will uh, go to rename and add the number. Okay, while you're doing that, um, we're gonna go ahead and start our meeting. I feel like I feel like we're like gearing up for a big game. It's like our last meeting of the year. And so it just, it feels, the energy feels good. It feels fun to have you all here. And those in the public, um, welcome as well. This is the standards and assessment meeting. Um, just quickly going to call roll to make sure everybody is for sure here. So Janet. I'm here finally. Yes, Sorry. number eight. Jenny Earl. I'm here. Thank you, Jenny. Scott Hansen. Present. And Mark Marsh. Here, Madam Chair. Okay, I think all our committee members are here. Um, Nora Lee, you ready to go? I'm ready. Thank you, Nora Lee. Okay, so um, since it's our last meeting, I have a jingle. It's I can't be called a poem because when I write it, it's more um, like Dr. Seuss. I mean, not even Dr. Seuss, but it's more of a jingle. And I tried to go through, like I went through my notebooks and I was like, okay, I tried to put through some things that we did this year because this is you guys. And uh, I'm just going to read it to you before we start our meeting. This is the Standards and Assessment 2020 jingle. In the year 2020, what did we do? We spent 50 plus hours on motions to move through a Jenny, Mark, Janet, Scott, Jenny, i.e. the almighty Patty and prime Nora Lee. So many others like Leah and Darren, Jeff drove the rules to keep us from swearing. Angie's legalese and Jennifer's precision led us through many core standards revisions. Keep us sharp, Brian, Jody, Christie, and Rhett, mental health, safety, maturation, consent. You seep and see stag peep, start smart and keep. The board's strategic goals form the acronym SHEEP. Keep going up, Jeff. Oh, it's, yes, that, oh, there you go. The ethics of testing and standards review, turn around bright eyes, rules repeal, amend new. When clarity's needed or we have viewpoints to weigh, Superintendent Sid Dixon joined in, save the day. There's Jamie and Jessica, Webby, Webke, Max Whitney, and Michelle, Sarah, Corby, Robert, and Tiffany. Ben Buse, Brooke, Brian, I'll start with B. We voted to a credit using a remote entity. Erica, Stem, Nathan, Christelle, Kim, and Scott, Lisa, all specialists, knowledge jackpots. Janalee, Shannon, Michelle, Betty, Sue, Susan, and David, John, Joel, Britton, too. POG, APAC, and Meeting Stream Live, CTE with Talia, and of course, Perkins 5. Holly and Access, diverse eyes, so we see the perspectives, the privilege, bring about equity. PJEB and waivers, test admin with right. Ashley and Wendy and their tech ed foresight. Sydney, Rebecca, Sybil, and Sherry, CSI, TSI, and counseling with Jerry. Strands, final readings, assurances, sped. Tracy and Tanya, early college adult ed, financial Deborah, nutrition prevention. If I don't end this jingle, I'll be sent to detention. Don't judge this, Diddy. My <laughs> goal's not Shakespeare. If I've left anyone out, insert your name here. This junket, this journey, step by step, you and me, traversed we together, a pro-ed jubilee. Dear Grammarian Janet and backpacking Scott, dear board member Marsh with the gardening plot, dear Jeep driving Jenny, I thank each of you for your time, humor, smarts, for your unique points of view. In my last state board meeting, I have one final motion for this committee, for staff, and I say it with closion. I move to accept you, Erin, to my home, and I second this motion with one final poem. When giving is oh. all we have by Alberto Rios. One river gives its journey to the next. We give because someone gave to us. We give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving has changed us. We give because giving could have changed us. We have been better for it. We have been wounded by it. Giving has many faces. It is loud and quiet, big though small diamond and wood nails. Its story is old, the plot worn and the pages too, but we read this book anyway, over and again. Giving is first and every time, hand to hand, mine to yours, yours to mine. You gave me blue and I gave you yellow. Together we are simple green. You gave me what you did not have and I gave you what I had to give. Together we made something greater from the difference. So thank you all for making a difference. Thank you for coming together and uh, making this committee a success. So thanks for indulging all my little silly poetry, but you guys, are you ready to work now? 
Jenny, will you send that to us? It's just a treasure. I don't know how you do it. My goodness, you're amazing. Well, it's a, I don't know. I'm a child at heart. What can I say? <laughs> it's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So we've had a little change in plans. We were going to go ahead and start with um, action item number one, school accountability. But um, we have a someone from public comment, um, Moses, uh, let's see, Moses Tatoli. I think Moses needs to go to another meeting. So um, I think we'll let you do your public comment first. And then we'll have the rest of the public comment before our access item number two. So Moses. Chair Grabbit. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can, can you guys I, hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Pat, Pat, Patty, will you, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that there was a three minute agreed upon timer. Do you want us to show that now or just go ahead and state it when the time is up? Okay, so I was gonna say either way, Moses, do you prefer to see the timer on the screen? You have a three minute time limit or? I'll be quick. Okay, quick. we can just, you know what, Patty, just if when it hits three minutes, just, I don't know, be nice, but give him a, give him a wave. <laughs> okay, Moses, thank you for being here. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity of having, uh, giving me uh, to uh, attend this meeting with you guys. So Jenny Earl reached out to me a few weeks ago to discuss this resolution addressing uh, racism. And, uh, and so just a little bit of background uh, of who I am. I, uh, was one of the first Tongan families, a member of one of the first Tongan families to move here to Utah back in 1970, and uh, I was two years old. And I've grown up in the education education system here, uh, went to Arizona State, uh, got a degree there, and uh, came and uh, was the first Tongan Pacific Islander born uh, to attend, uh, be accepted to medical school up here at the university. And I've been actively involved in, with our politics. I'm the chairman of our uh, Pacific Island uh, Republican Coalition here in Utah. And I've worked with Burgess Owens um, on his uh, campaign staff. And so I wanted to share with you guys, uh, Burgess uh, sent a statement for me to read. He apologized. He wanted to be on this Zoom call and uh, he's on the plane right now, but he sent me a statement and, and I'll just read that real quick because it really has, it, it's a lot of what I feel as a minority that grew up here in Utah and values our Utah uh, education system. Uh, it reads, as a child of the segregated South, when racial tensions were at its height, I was the benefactor of being taught in America, all things were possible, there is an, an there is an inherent racism behind the notion that skin color provides privilege. Our young men and women uh, deserve to be taught that they too are capable of anything, regardless of race. We live in a country that despite faults, uh, we strive to see others from inside out rather than outside in, and we should take pride in that. Um, so that's a statement from Burgess Owens and having worked with Burgess Owens uh, quite a lot in the last year, I do know that he uh, feels exactly as I do um, that uh, we, you know, when it comes to addressing race, we're very careful with it because we don't want to isolate our minority groups and make them uh, position them to be treated any in any special way or, or have educators feel that uh, they need to walk on eggs with uh, addressing them. And I, I've reached out to other community leaders in the minority groups, our Latino Republican uh, chair, uh, the African-American Republican chair, uh, city councilwoman in Mill Creek, uh, Bev Weepy, uh, who's also a Pacific Islander. And, and you know, we, we all, uh, support this resolution that uh, that Jenny sent out to us, and and uh, so just wanted to share those thoughts with you guys. Thank you so much. Perfect timing too. Okay, we'll do the rest of our public comment right before the access agenda item, so that it it ties in a little better. But let's go ahead. I hope those of you who are here for public comment are okay 
to stay on. Is there anybody who cannot stay on long and needs to go now? We're just going to do one agenda item before we move. Okay, um, then committee. Our first actionable item is um, school accountability. And if you looked, of course, you looked at the backup stuff, it talks about how we approved APAC's recommendation to take steps to relieve schools from federal and state accountability determinations based on the 2021 assessments. So our job, as Darren will probably explain, is to take a look at the staff prepared addendum and waiver so that these requests can be sent to the US Department of Education by February. So Darren um, or Leah or whoever is taking lead on this, will you go ahead and give us some background? Yeah, thank you. And as I, Chair Gravett, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'm gonna turn the time over to Anne Michelle Neal, your Good. accountability specialist. So Anne Michelle, if you wanna pull your slides up and I'll just say a couple of things and then we'll uh, turn the time over to her. Um, just a reminder that uh, as Chair Gravett pointed out, the, res or the uh, direction that staff was given by the board in November was to seek uh, relief from school accountability from state and federal uh, accountability um, provisions and requirements. Today, we're going to be speaking directly to the federal path. Um, as, as I think uh, all board members understand, there are two different ways to resolve. Well, there's uh, one path that we'll deal with to rectify issues around the state accountability, school accountability, and then the federal or U.S. Department of Education has separate processes in place. And Anne Michelle is an expert on those. Uh, she eats, drinks, and sleeps uh, accountability, federal accountability, and particularly. And we'll turn the time over to her to talk to you about the work that's been done by her and other staff members since the uh, board member or board meeting in November. So, Anne okay, Michelle, thank you, Darren. Okay. Um, I think you should be seeing the slideshow now, and I just want to make it. Sound check that you can hear me. Yes, very good. Okay. Yes, as Darren said, I'm here to discuss the uh, the federal uh, accountability addendum and waiver, and how that will help us to achieve the um, recommendations from APAC to uh, provide relief to schools from from accountability in um, this current year, 2020-2021. Um, so in terms of tools or avenues that we have to achieve this, the Department of Education has provided um, three different um, avenues for us to take. Uh, the um, goal, I, I guess the pathways that we've chosen are ones that we see as the path of least, res least resistance that will help us to accomplish our goals. Um, as those three those three avenues are an, an addendum, an amendment, and a waiver. These all relate to our ESSA consolidated state plan. An addendum is intended to be a one-year um, sort of extension of the March accountability waiver that was that was um, approved for I think all fifty states in, last last spring. Um, but the addendum is addresses temporary changes in nature that only apply to this to the current accountability cycle. An amendment is a much longer process, which is a permanent change to our uh, as a state plan. Um, and that would apply if we were thinking of um, permanently changing the reweighting of indicators or the um, you know, other kinds of things. At this time, we are not pursuing an amendment. Um, a waiver is intended to address, um, it's a separate process requesting for our, the Department of Education to approve an alternative process that falls outside of the, what is allowed in the addendum. Um, it's, and, and is also perhaps not a permanent change such as such as the, an amendment would be. So today we're going to talk about what is contained in our addendum and our waiver. So the addendum requires um, a few things. It requires a public comment period, which we're preparing for uh, after the decision of, of this committee meeting. Um, and it requires governor engagement and it requires a deadline for submission of February 1st. 
That is in order for the department to determine whether the amendment complies with the statutory requirements in time for the state to make and implement the changes that we are requesting to our accountability system. An amendment can be submitted after, but based on discussions with the Department of Adam and CCSSO, um, addendums that are submitted after that date cannot, they can't guarantee that they can respond in a timeline that would respect our timeline for, for calculating accountability. So uh, the contents of the addendum at large are these five broad categories. And I apologize, you're probably going to see my furry friends at some point during this presentation <laughs> um, sitting next to me. So uh, the addendum first addresses long-term goals, then the calculation of indicators. Then it discusses adjustments to CSI identifications, to TSI identifications, and then um, at the end, it briefly just asks a few simple questions about CSI and TSI exit criteria. Uh, this is summarized here, um, but we're, I'm going to walk through each one of these for you. Um, you have the addendum draft in your backup. And um, so my goal is to break down all of the technical language um, just to make clear what exactly we are pursuing in the addendum. So the first section of the addendum addresses state long-term goals. Uh, this is uh, in the ESSA plan, we defined our long-term goals as the same as the education elevated goals. Uh, this addendum would just request that we shift forward by one year our long-term goals. You can see in the image that I've included, this is the long-term goals for our English learners. And so we have goals for 17, 18, and 19. 2020 is sort of like a pause year. And that's something that you can kind of think out of throughout this presentation that the 2020 school year, the school year that um, ended last May is it's sort of a we're sort of pressing pause on that year and and shifting everything forward um, in order to uh, account for the impacts of COVID-19, school staff closures, and the absence of assessment data. So uh, the first section just says that we will shift forward our state long-term goals by one year. Uh, those long-term goals would pick up, they don't change, they just pick up where we left off in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Uh, this isn't the, this is maybe two sections down, but I wanted to address it first because it is sort of the crutch or um, the, the basic assertion uh, for the rest of the waiver. Um, and that is our annual system of meaningful differentiation. When we say annual meaningful differentiation, what we're talking about is the ranking of schools, the assignment of overall ratings, such as letter grades, and identifying the lowest performing schools for the purposes of CSI and TSI. Uh, without 2019-2020, as you see here is X'd out because we don't have assessment data, the board, the first recommendation from APAC that was accepted by the board was not to skip your growth. Skip your growth would calculate growth based on 2018-19 to 2020-2021. We have chosen not to use that calculation for accountability purposes. Instead, we are choosing to um, not calculate growth until 2023. Uh, even though it appears that we could calculate, uh, apologies, I'm gonna back up a bit. Growth requires two, at least one, prior year of assessment data to calculate. Um, we could calculate growth in 2021-2022, but with the unknowns that we have, um, concerns about participation rates and students being in and out of in-person instruction and the challenges to um, 
getting students into schools, we don't know at this time what uh, that data will look like and how reliable that data set is. Also, I think it's really important to acknowledge that in the second recommendation from the access, I'm sorry, from the APAC committee was uh, that 2021, 2022, we're seeking relief for accountability. If we were to use that year to calculate growth, that isn't truly honoring the, the intent of that, of that recommendation. And so we plan to use 2021, 2022, and 2022, and 2023 to achieve a reliable growth calculation. So one of the pieces of the addendum is to uh, shift forward our system of annual meaningful differentiation. Um, then I guess before that actually in the addendum order is the calculation of indicators. Uh, as just as I just described that um, we are proposing to uh, in the addendum to calculate growth in 2022, 2023 based on the prior year and that year's assessment data. Uh, the next section, um, you'll see this large chart, and I don't expect you to be able to read it, but I just want to point out that column D is, is where we are defining as a state what we plan to do moving forward uh, with uh, identifying schools. So the first section is CSI identification or comprehensive support and improvement. That is this the group of schools that are identified in the lowest 5% uh, based on a three-year average, and that identification must be made once every three years. We are recommending or at requesting in the addendum that we shift that identification. With our next round was planned to be in the fall of 2021, and that we are shifting forward by two years to the fall of 2023 when growth can be reliably calculated. Um, the next section in the addendum is that Title I TSI schools who do not improve. Uh, in the statute, uh, Title I schools who are identified for consistently underperforming, underperforming student groups identified for TSI uh, based on their student group performance, if they do not make progress within four years, that they um, elevate to CSI status. That determination was initially defined in our SS state plan to occur in the fall of 2022, and we're requesting a one-year uh, um, adjustment to identify those schools in the fall of 2023. As a team, we had a lot of discussion about this. Um, about We had 156 schools, which I believe is about half, roughly, of the schools that were identified um, who made their, their uh, who met the exit criteria in 2018-19. And so we have included in the addendum a process by which schools may if they meet the exit criteria in 2021-2022, that they may exit early, which was always the intention of our ESSA plan. They had a maximum of four years, but could exit early if they met the criteria. So there is language in there to say that uh, these schools may exit based on two non-consecutive years of data if they meet that exit criteria early. Uh, the the next section is the waiver re required is the uh, extension for TSI. Um, our next this TSI is an annual identification, and so if we initially on our trajectory in our timeline expected to identify new TSI schools in the fall of 2021. And we feel now that we can't do that until the fall 2023. That is a two-year extension. And because of the nature of TSI being an annual identification, this requires a waiver. So the waiver that you have in your backup is entirely um, addressing the 
the rationale and the reason why we are requesting a two-year extension for TSI um, and, and not just a one-year extension. Uh, at the very end of the addendum, it, it says that there are exit criteria for CSI and TSI will not consider 2021. It's a very simple decision that since we decided not to calculate skip year growth, that exit determinations could not be made in this, in this particular year for, for CSI and TSI, except for uh, the provision that I just mentioned. Um, so it's very fast. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very well open to um, answering any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Anne Michelle. Let me see what kinds of questions uh, committee members have. Um, committee members, what are you wondering about? What do you need to know? Uh, Board Member Earl, go ahead. Okay, so. I, I just have a question because I have a I have a, a school and I, I think you've answered that but let me just make sure one of my schools um, that I've spoken with should have exited this last spring with the TSI but um, now they'll be waiting until 2022 is that correct the fall of 2022 in order to exit out is that accurate yes if they meet the exit criteria in this current year, the addendum language does allow them to exit in this year, or they have an additional year if needed. Okay, you're just saying, so they could exit this year, um, but they could also extend one more year, depending on, mm -hmm. okay, I see. And that's what I was trying to get clarification on. They were a little disappointed this past year, obviously, because they wanted to exit, but um, they were unsure if it was gonna take two more years for them to gather the data. So, and then, can I ask another question, Chair? Of course. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with so we're we're not calculating growth this year, and we're not calculating calculating growth the end of next year. Is that for all students that we're proposing that, and do we need a legislative change on that as well? Uh, I do not believe it would require a legislative change, um, and I may ask Darren to 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 um, come in and hear, but that is the purpose of the addendum is to define to the Department of, Edu of Education what our intentions are. And so, so this addendum still, okay. allows us to make that change without making a, an amendment, like a permanent amendment, and then coming back and undoing that amendment to return to our, like our intended system. The addendum allows us to do that on a federal level. Oh, okay. So we'll still calculate growth in the state, but we won't calculate it for our federal. Is that what I'm understanding? Um, that's a really good question. Um, okay. We have the ability to look at other indicators, and we we haven't quite fully defined out how we would we would determine if a school would meet exit criteria. Maybe. They do so on achievement and whatever other indicators they are able to calculate. Um, but, but we wanted to, uh, the intent was to honor the, the improvement that schools made in 2018-19 and, and not disregard that improvement that they made with their student groups that were identified okay. for TSI. I'm in agreement with that. I just want to make sure I understand the balance there. So. Okay, I'm wondering if we need some kind of a legislative change because that's required um, for our state accountability. So anyways, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know if Darren has a comment to you on that. Darren, did you want to comment on that? I see. Can, I can see that you put some things in the chat. It might be good to say some of those. Yeah, I was just uh, trying to enter those comments in there. So our policy team, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is really a two-prong approach. Today we're talking just strictly about federal accountability. Um, and partially because of the timeline that we're on. Um, we're fortunate in Utah that our legislative session still lies in front of us. Our policy team has begun um, outreach work with our legislative body and there will be legislative uh, relief that'll need to be sought because growth is a significant portion of our school accountability system. In the elementary level, it's, I think it's over 50% of the points come from growth. 
Um, and in order to calculate growth using our model, um, we require two consecutive years of achievement scores in, in, uh, in a content area. So uh, board member Earl, we will uh, be working with the state legislature. Today's, uh, this discussion um, is really centered on the steps we need to take to support the board's direction to seek relief from federal um, accountability requirements. And chair, if I may add to that, mm -hmm. uh, that that in the addenda, we just wanted to make sure that we were covering our bases um, by including that that provision um, and to honor that improvement and growth that was made in 2018, 2019. Oh, board thank member you for Gravick, that. Chair Gravick, can I ask yep. one more question then? Are you you yep, made a statement, um, and Michelle, that there was we were maybe going to use other markers at the end of the, to possibly uh, show that growth. Is that things that the I, district doing? Is that accurate? What I meant to say was uh, that we would work through a, a process where we would use the indicators that are available that are already defined in our accountability system. Okay. Whether it be, um, it's very possible we could have achievement and English learner progress. Uh, and make a determination based on that. For secondary, we would have achievement, graduation rate, post-secondary, coursework engagement, um, and and we, like I said, we still need to kind of think through exactly how those business rules would be defined about what is adequate um, adequate progress in the school to meet the exit criteria with outgrowth in the calculation, um, but still honoring that improvement that was made earlier. Oh, I'm, I'm in a complete agreement with that. I think that's a great way to go. I just, wanted, I just wanted to understand what we're, I know we're talking federal, but this would be relevant too. Thank you. No, great questions, Jenny. Uh, board member Hanson, question. Thanks. Yeah, and I appreciate the PowerPoint that uh, mm -hmm. I went through the application and much easier to understand when yeah. we're looking at pictures. So yeah. thank you for um, dumbing that down or whatever you did to make it so it was understandable. Um, but um, so I understand we adopted the no skip year calculation. And a lot of this just flowed from that decision. Uh, do we know how unusual that uh, position is going to be? Are our colleagues in other states doing the same thing? Or are we going to be an outlier? How much scrutiny is there going to be um, on our application. Do we even have a sense for that? Um, I don't think, my sense is that there's not going to be much pushback uh, in our addendum request regarding this issue. Uh, ha being just met with um, the accountability systems and reporting CCSSO group in October, my sense was that a lot of states are using the skip year calculation, but other states like Illinois are not. Um, I don't have a sense of like what exactly how many states are using which model, but um, we are not alone in not using skip your growth. And but there are other states that are, that are that are considering using it. I tend to agree with the decision of the APAC committee and with the board that skip your growth is. Um, is a, is a challenging um, and problematic uh, choice. And if I could just soapbox for a second, that's, what, that's it. But um, in the analysis that we did and presented previously, um, we found that even looking at 2017 to 2019, skip your growth, we modeled that calculation and there was enough difference in the growth measure that it would impact the outcomes of accountability. And so it felt very, very, they felt like we should be very cautious in using skip your growth in a pandemic year mm -hmm. uh, when we are seeing changes that would be impactful in conditions where there was not a pandemic mm -hmm. occurring. And so that was the rationale behind choosing not to use skip your growth. And I just want to add, if, in case you guys didn't see the chat box, Darren added something that I think is important. He just said that the streamlined addendum 
um, was provided by the U.S. Department of Education. And so that's an indication that they are expecting significant numbers of addendum requests. So Scott, does that help answer your question or do you have a follow-up? No, I think that um, gets me there. I just wanted to know how likely it was that we were going to have to pull out all the information that we considered when we made the yeah. decision on skip year to justify. And it sounds like not too likely. So yeah. thank you yeah. very much. Appreciate the good work all around. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, any yeah, other I, I, oh, go ahead. I, have, I just, I don't expect a lot of pushback on not choosing, choosing not to use skip year growth from this in this addendum. Um, Jenny, your hand's still up, but I don't know if that's just left from, I just don't want to not give you the opportunity to ask any other questions. Okay, do we have any other questions? And if there are none, um, I would love to entertain a motion. Madam Chair. Thank you, Board, Board Member Marsh. And I would uh, like to make that motion if we could. I would move that the committee approve the addendum and waiver request to the Utah Consolidated Plan and forward to the board for final approval. Thank you, Board Member Marsh. So the motion before the committee is that the committee approve the addendum and waiver request to the Utah Consolidated Plan and forward to the board for approval. Is there any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, uh, go ahead and vote now. Okay, that motion carries unanimously. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Anne Michelle. Thank you for, um, as board member Hansen said, dumbing it down for us. The pictures really, really help. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Hmm. I'm sorry we didn't get to see more of your furry friends. <laughs> there it is. Oh, yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that face is so cute. Thank you. Okay, so our next actionable item is the access recommendations for consideration. And as I said before, we have some public comment. Um, so we're gonna hear from those who have signed up before we get into our questions, our discussions, our motion makings, and what the plan is, um, as you saw before, each person will have um, up to three minutes and there'll be a timer on the screen so you can kind of monitor yourself um, with the exception of those comments from our committees, they can have up to five minutes. So unless somebody has an issue, we're going to start with Nicolie Peck. And after Nicolie, we'll have Dr. Lexi Cunningham. We'll start there. So um, Nicolie, are you of here and available? I'm here, but can you can you see me? Can you hear me? We can I can hear you. I cannot see you. Okay. I have um allowed my video, but I guess if it's not going to show. She can be she can be she can see you. Okay, oh, I just might not have because you know you have to scroll through a bunch of people. So I'll okay, find you. Got it. Thank I'll you. I'll find your smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I okay. appreciate it. So I'm speaking today to the two resolutions that were made by board member Gravit and board member Earl that you guys are going to be discussing today. And um, I feel like this is a really important topic. I really appreciate both board member Gravit and board member Earl's um, kindness and, and sensitivity to some of the cultural elements that we're dealing with in our society today and all that kind of thing. Um, but I definitely, after looking over the two, am in favor more of board member Earl's rev resolution and I will explain why. So you need to know I'm president of the Worldwide Organization for Women. I'm also a parent in the state of Utah. I also am a parenting expert. I'm the head of teachingselfgovernment.com, which is a parenting course. Anyway, I'm gonna be taking my uh, findings today from this book called The Coddling of the American Mind. It's written by two authors, um, both college professors, Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt. One is a Democrat, one is a moderate. This book and the ideas in this book have been heralded bipartisanly uh, around the nation. Uh, President Obama, when they first came out with the ideas in this book, spoke very highly of it. And so I just wanted to explain to you some of the ideas that are presented in uh, board member, um, I just am losing names now. Anyway, so some of the ideas that are in board member Gravit, excuse me, sorry, Chair. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, it's either I one or two. 
Yes. Anyway, some of the ideas that are presented in board member Gravitt's um, resolution were discussed at length in this book and actually were cautioned against. And so this is why I want to bring this up. So there's a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw. In 2016, she did a TED talk on something called intersectionality, which oftentimes we see graphs that look like this. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know what my own screen looked like. So hopefully you saw that. But anyway, um, since this new theory of intersectionality has come on the scene, there have been a lot of problems, especially on college campuses, that these authors have noticed. And I just want to quote some things from their book. So they said, the human mind is prepared for tribalism, and these interpretations of intersectionality have the potential to turn tribalism way up. Intersectionality teach people to see bipolar um, dimensions of privilege and oppression oppression as ubiquitous and social interactions. And then he goes on to say that people actually that are taught this might not listen to their professors, might think worse of themselves, that it actually keeps the people down instead of being able to rise up. And I think what we see in board member Earl's resolution is that everybody gets potential where in- Pardon me, your time is up. Thank, thank you. Anyway, you get, <laughs> Thank you so much. you get the idea that it actually is not a good idea to make things bipolar. I it's appreciate always a hard that. Thing to be a timekeeper. So in the best of intentions. <laughs> That's why I made you do it, Patty. <laughs> Thank you again. Our next um, speaker will be Dr. Lexi Cunningham. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Gravett and members of the committee. And thank you for permitting me to speak today. I'd like to commend the Board of Education, USD leadership, and the Access Committee for your courageous decision in undertaking discussions and potential actions in supporting underrepresented, historically marginalized, and under underserved students. Your mission as a board reads, the Utah State Board of Education leads by creating equitable conditions for student success, advocating for necessary resources, developing policy and providing effective oversight and support. I have been impressed in your focus on providing equitable con conditions for all students. I have always believed that all means all. If we believe that all children belong and all children deserve an equitable education, then we must continue to be bold in our actions. In order to ensure that all students have the same opportunities, we must consider that students throughout our state encounter inequity. At yesterday's meeting, Superintendent Dixon highlighted your strategic plan. Throughout the plan, there are examples of how students are not achieving at the same level. In 2019, third grade ELL students were 30% below non-ELL students on reading assessments. 70% of white students scored and 18 on the ACT test, while only 34% of black students scored above an 18. In 2019, 18, 0.3% of our Latino students dropped out compared to 10.6 of other students. Data shows that our students of color are disciplined at a higher rate than other students. If all means all, the time is now to address these inequalities. Together, we can help all children succeed and close learning gaps. Much of this work has begun and the portrait of a graduate will only help along our journey. In 2018, there were approximately 659 children in Utah K-12 public schools 26% of these children are minorities, 131,800 students. We live in a very complex time. Our children have witnessed social unrest and are struggling uh, with what to think, what to say, what to do. Some of our minority children have been targets of racist behavior and our racism. This is their reality. It is not something they watch on television. It is not, it is not something that is only happening in other parts of the country. It is real and it is happening in Utah. It is happening in our schools. It is happening to our, our students. So what do we do as leaders in the state? I applaud districts that are addressing this head on. All of the national alphabet organizations have um, pledged to address equity and race. We have seen schools and districts across the state, across the country, adopting resolutions, denouncing racist behavior and racism and pledging to close the achievement gap. I think that we need to be the next state that does that. 
I thank you for your time, your leadership, your courage, um, and commitment to, to all students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lexi Cunningham. Um, our next uh, speaker will be Davis School Board President, John Ritchie. Jennifer, thank you, Chair Gravitt. This is John Robinson from Davis School District uh, speaking today. Thank you for providing me an opportunity to offer a comment during the meeting. I wanna speak in support of uh, Chair Gravitt's uh, resolution denouncing racism and racial inequality in Utah schools. I wanna share with you to begin with what we've learned in Davis School District. Within the last year, we took the opportunity to conduct a survey of our minority students regarding whether they feel safe and comfortable in our schools. As is pointed out in the resolution, and I quote, Utah law provides that every student in the public school should have the opportunity to learn in an environment which is safe, conducive to the learning process and free from unnecessary disruption. What we found in Davis District is that the majority of our minority students do not feel safe and comfortable, particularly our African-American students. The results of our survey told us that as a district, we have some work to do to correct the problems we were made aware of. Toward the end of the resolution, it states, again, I quote, the starting point of our work in racial equity must be reflection and internal examination, close quote. This is where we're at in our district. And it has been very helpful for us to go through this process, which continues even as we speak today. It has been said in some of the social media posts that I've read uh, that this is an extremism approach that is being considered by the state board. Reference has been made to this being the beginning of the implementation of extreme theology in our schools. I would tell you this, I do not believe that state board members who support this resolution are trying to promote any extreme belief. Nor do I believe that those who have posted messages on social media about the resolution, opening the door for extreme beliefs are doing so to promote racial inequality or discrimination. Th those things don't exist. What I do believe is this, as state board members, you are all desirous to do the right thing for all students and all educators. I would encourage you to not get caught up in the national rhetoric with the buzzwords of extremism and cancel culture shaping your views on what is best for Utah's public education system. We have great educators and we have great students in this state and they deserve state and local board members who will work to meet the needs of each individual. In passing this resolution, you will begin a process that will enable, that will enable all students and all educators to work together to build a brighter and more equitable future for public education. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, make this comment. Thank you. Thank you, John Robison. I realized I said Richie before thinking of a Weaver School District's board president, but I just wanted to make sure I corrected that. Thank you so much for your comments and for the work you do on the Davis School Board. Um, next, we'll have a uh, school board member, Sean Newell. Hey, thank you for having me today. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for the comments that they've made so far. Um, this is something that's really critical. Uh, um, when we're looking at equity, we're not looking for something in addition for certain individuals over other individuals. We're looking for this, um, this space of safety. We're looking also to alleviate fear. And what I've heard and seen and read in the last couple of weeks is a lot of fear. You know, fear is something that's natural to us. There are two basic behaviors that occur when we are fearful. One is to fight and one is to flight. But we as human beings have actually a third behavior that we can actually engage. And that is learning. That is understanding through our learning that we are all in this together. There are many students that attend our schools that, that come to school with hidden burdens, with pressures that are unseen, that are unfelt by many that have never experienced subjugation, that have never experienced being ostracized or being excluded in one shape, way, shape, manner, or form. Me for one, I in 1968, 
I was part of a busing program in Southern California to desegregate our schools. And I had this experience myself in knowing what it's like to go into an environment where you are unwelcome. You're unwelcome by the students. You're unwelcome by the teachers. You're unwelcome by the administration because they were forced into something. We have an opportunity here during this time in 2020 without force, but being willing to change, being willing to embrace one another, being willing to create a system that is equitable for all. Believe me that there are inequities within our systems. And these are not purposeful on, on the surface, but they have been in place for a long time. And it's time that we fracture some of these systems and develop a means of coming together as people because we all are in this together at every level, be it with students, be it with the parents, be it with administration. It is important for us to engage and take both parts of these initiatives from, from both of our representatives here and devise a, you know, a policy that's conducive to everybody coming together. You know, I share these things you know, with my heart wide open because I believe that these change can happen. I've experienced the change. I've watched Utah grow. I've been here for 40 years. I've been a part at every single level of education here after high school. But I've also worked with a number of young people from elementary school to middle school to high school and in college. I've mentored them. I've, I've talked to them. And I understand they are willing to change as well. So as a society and as a community and as a, a governing body, we need to come together and figure this out. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Board Member Newell. Um, our next speaker will be Board Member Thorpe. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Simply, I just wanted to um, express my support for Jennifer Gravitt's resolution and I will not take three minutes, I will take three sentences to say that she, in her resolution, it simply states, and I support and condemn white supremacy, hate speech and hate crime. I support bias-free testing for students. I support equity training for USBE staff. And I support reflection of and re-examination of systems and standards, disciplinary practices, and curricula. And that is what the resolution encompasses. I am in full support of that resolution. Thank you, Board Member Thorpe. Um, our next two will be, um, they will be speaking from committees. The first one will be um, John Arthur from representing the Access Committee. And then after that, we'll have Ella Rechtenbach from the Student Advisory Committee. Um, John? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, um, thank you for the opportunity to go ahead and speak here today. Um, I've really appreciated hearing all of the public comments, um, especially from the board members. Um, every one of us is focused on supporting our students, and that's what these recommendations from our committee do. They provide targeted supports for a specific subset of students of our kids who are underrepresented and historically marginalized and uh, underserved in our schools. After listening to the comments, I want to assure you that these kids are real. These kids are my students. I know their names and their needs are not perceived or forced upon them. They are genuine. Uh, my students have experienced marginalization, racism, xenophobia, continued overrepresentation in behavioral referrals, uh, and underrepresentation in advanced classes. These are children who feel unsafe in our schools and for whom the current environment is full of disruptions and is not conducive to their learning. This is all about providing services that a significant number of Utah students need to succeed. This is a time of crisis, and these recommendations that our committee put forward are about crisis relief. They're about disaster relief for these specific students. Really quickly, I just wanna go over the recommendations again from the memo that the Access Committee submitted, just to make sure that we're all clear on exactly what is being asked for in our memo and how they speak to the resolution. Our first recommendation was um, for 
um, the board to put forward a resolution um, that says we stand with you, our Utah students, against racism, the racism that you experience. I'm, I'm paraphrasing all these recommendations just to make sure that they're clear uh, the same way that I would with my students in class. Um, the second recommendation uh, puts forward that the state should help facilitate professional learning that will better equip educators and administrators to not only denounce racism, but dismantle it. Um, our third recommendation extends that professional learning to include conquering the digital divide for all students. Our fourth recommendation uh, also extended technical and linguistic support to the families of these students. And our final recommendation asks that going forward, academic curricula, content and resources recognize and celebrate the contributions and experiences of the communities that these specific kids come from. Uh, fortunately, while these recommendations uh, ask that these specific students be kept in mind, uh, they benefit all students and would build our capacity to serve and educate every single one of them. Every single Utah student would benefit from uh, these recommendations being moved forward into action. Um, finally, you know, as you weigh your different options, as an advisor to this board, I would simply ask that you apply a simple test when weighing different options and proposals. Which choice will better meet the needs of underrepresented, historically marginalized, and uh, underserved students? Whichever um, option before you falls best within that, uh, that uh, idea, then please ask you, let you move it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, I know we're having a little bit of trouble. I don't know if we were able to get Ella Rechtenbach back in, but if not, I believe Jeffrey Van Holten will be reading her statement. Yes, she was not able to get back in. She uh, got inadvertently removed from the meeting and can't get back in to oh. the security feature, but she did send me her uh, statement and it reads as follows, just so everyone knows, Ella, Ella let me start the timer on myself. Dr. <laughs> Buck is the chair, the co-chair of the Student Advisory Council, and this is what she had to say. On November 20th, the Student Advisory Council voted to support the access recommendations, and our letter of support is forthcoming. As a council representing the diverse voices of students in Utah, we strongly support these recommendations because we believe they will open the door to furthering educational equity in the Utah education system. We have heard from the students we represent as council members that they suffer from inequalities caused by our current education system. Their voices need to be heard and we believe the access recommendations accurately reflects the desires of Utah students. For this reason, we strongly urge you to consider these recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff, for reading that on behalf of Ella. Um, I just wanna thank um, all of you who spoke um, from your perspectives. I, I so appreciate your insights, your personal experience, your beliefs, and your knowledge, regardless of where you fall in terms of what you think should be done. Um, before we dive in, I just, I want to remind committee members and the public what we're voting on today. We had a lot of emails, and I think it can be very confusing. So I just want to kind of frame the discussion first. So we're voting on the Access Committee's recommendation number one. That's to create a resolution denouncing racism and racial inequalities in Utah schools. What we're not voting on is curriculum. Um, critical race theory, we are not voting on that. We are not voting on the 1619 project. We're not even voting on the definitions. Those are there for us to use for some consistency. We're not voting on political ideologies. And I just, I hope that as a committee, we can remember this so that we can focus our discussion and accomplish something meaningful and productive. And then finally, since I have a re resolution in this agenda item, I'm going to turn the chairmanship over to Vice Chair Marsh and um, I'm going to let him take it now. Vice Chair Marsh, you good? I'm good to go, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, I give it to you. Okay, thank you, Chair Gravett, uh, for the opportunity to chair. I feel like uh, Shrek trying to fit into Cinderella's shoes at the ball. Never been called uh, Cinderella before, sorry. 
because you've been such a great uh, mentor and leader for our group. Um, we got a date today that wanted to get started, but to get us started, I asked Dr. Patty if she would kind of give us a, a little bit of an overview and some background about what we're talking about today. Yes. Oh, I do not have poems. I'm sorry. I, I love to read those, but I can't write them. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman. Um, I, I first of all want to say that I'm actually humbled to even uh, pr approach this topic today, just by those that spoke this morning and the passion that, that every single speaker had towards achieving what's best for Utah students. And just that love and generosity and kindness towards students. It's just something humbling to hear, um, although I know that it's ev evident everywhere. So I just wanted to first um, say thank you for letting me participate in this as well. As we're moving forward, the first thing I wanted to do was to be able to guide you through the nine documents that are um, included on the access agenda item. There's been some confusion about those nine items and I wanted to just be really clear the intended purpose of those. Although sometimes intentions aren't always what's best, this was the intended purpose of the documents on there. The first document on there is the access recommendations. And um, the access recommendations, for those of you who do not know, ACCESS stands for the Advisory Committee on Equity of Educational Services for Students. And if we could just take a minute, um, Rosanna and Brian, can you, Rosanna, could you just uh, have everyone on your committee that's on really quick, turn on their camera and just do a wave as you just tell us what their names are? Sure, uh, thank you, Patty. Um, so I'm Rosanna benali Sag. I'm the chair of the Access Committee. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge um, the vice chair, Brian Yazi. And then we have um, John Arthur. And I also want to mention he is the 2021 um, uh, Teacher of the Year. And then we also have Dr. Klasina Mahan Reynolds. Um, and then also Dr. Kalina Pott. So, um, and then the rest of our committee has done a great job in developing these uh, recommendations and working uh, with the board as far as our communicating with the board as far as um, our recommendations go. So thank you, Patty. Well, I also wanted to be able to state that they are willing to stay on during this agenda item. And they probably are gonna stay on for all of them because it'll be so exciting, but especially for this agenda item that if any of you board members have questions during this topic. So the, um, the second item on here, um, just to clarify also, today they, they submitted five recommendations. Today we will only be discussing recommendation number one, the resolution. And so all of the attachments here are, are something to do with that resolution. It's been um, asked and, and approved by Chair Gravitt that um, for going forward, we would address the other resolutions as they came. So we would then be addressing resolution or the recommendation number two, next month three and so forth so that we can give it the time that it deserves in, in hearing and providing those updates as needed to the board and, and receiving that board direction. So um, as we move those through those, um, there's really an ability here when we provide the updates to see how they interact with some of the other things that we're doing. For example, the portrait of a graduate or the personalized competency-based learning. There's just, it's just the right time where everything right now is new and that, that ability to integrate all of those can happen at this point. So the next is an internal update. So that provides board members with some of the things that staff or are being done internally at this time. It is just a snapshot. If any of you want more information on any of those individual items, feel free to contact me and I can provide more information. It was just meant as, um, to be a snapshot of some of the things that are occurring to support the recommendations already. Um, Superintendent Dixon and I did join Access Committee, I think a few months back and presented uh, some of these updates to them so they're aware. And we are also providing those updates to Access Committee during their meetings so um, and getting their input as well. Next on there, um, there are two resolutions. One of the resolutions is from Chair Gravit and the other is for Board Member Gravit. So both of those resolutions are included. The next two items on there are a vocabulary. And there's, this has caused some um, um, concerns out in the community because um, you always learn, or I always learn after something is done. So the lesson that I learned on this was um, in providing something, I should probably put at the top of it the intended purpose of the document. Um, without that, um, it, it's done two ways. One, it's the vocabulary that's listed in a learning order. So we have a, a committee here that is the, um, 
creating a culturally responsive workplace. We call it the crew committee. And what it's doing is seeing what we can do internally first to see if there's any policies, rules, hiring practices, anything that we are doing internally where we can help um, look at anything that might include racism in our um, and making it a more culturally inclusive workplace where everyone feels comfortable to be, work and thrive. And with that, um, we noticed uh, that the first thing that happened was people felt uncomfortable. And we realized that it was because we all don't speak the same language. And what I mean by that is when a word is stated, implicit bias, um, white privilege, any of these things are stated, everyone has a different meaning to that word in their mind. It could be a different theoretical framework, a different political perspective on that. To move this work forward in any way whatsoever, we first have to come to a common understanding of the words. And if you notice, I didn't say agreement on the words because the, the definitions will never be agreed upon by 100% of the people. But we can come to a common understanding and agree that these are the definitions when USBE internal staff speak, this is what we mean by that word when it is spoken. And that actually provided a level of comfort to people to be able to think that what they're saying isn't going to be misinterpreted or misrepresented and that they could engage and access the conversation in ways that they hadn't been able to before. So that was the purpose of those documents. Those documents were not meant to say that we're teaching this in schools, that we're teaching this to teachers or anything like that. It's a common framework, a common reference for us to feel safe in discussing these topics. Next um, on that, and, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, one of the terms, just so that it, that it becomes clear, one of the terms on there is racist. And I know that there's many different theoretical frameworks, there's different political views, but for our work here at USBE, the term racist refers to a behavior and not a person. So what that means is a person can have make a racist statement, but that doesn't mean that the person is racist. It's the behavior that is racist and that is something a behavior can be worked on. And so that is something that it wouldn't label an entire person. And so that was something that through the work of this entire committee um, was agreed upon that the racist would then be an action or a behavior. So those are some of the ideas. And so it includes the definition and then it includes some situational awareness surrounding those definitions as to how things might be interpreted. So it was meant to be a help so that we did have that common understanding moving forward. It is in draft. We're continually adding to it and getting feedback from board members, from stakeholders. We're using it in different um, ways internally and really being able to say, here is something that someone was confused with. Can we help by adding something to the definition? So it's meant as a help resource. Um, lastly on this, um, our um, pro Jeff Van Holten is going, he did, did the work of comparing the two documents that you'll have before you today, the two resolutions. And Jeff did it in a way that it doesn't matter, it'll be up to you, Chair Marsh, um, which is, uh, it compares uh, board member Gravitz to board member Earls and board member Earls to board member Gravitz. Either way, from whichever document we start, we'll be doing the same thing moving forward. So at this time, Chair Marsh, um, let me know if you have any questions on the documents that are contained, or if you would like staff to pull up one of those resolutions, um, that comparison document, and if so, which one. Thank you, um, and I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Norman, uh, for that. Uh, we will, I'm going to give each uh, document an opportunity to be viewed and, and debated and talked about today. Uh, I think I'll just go in the order that we received them. I'm going to start um, with the uh, uh, one by uh, board member Gravitt. Chair Gravitt has proposed a resolution denouncing racism and racial inequalities in Utah schools. So um, I'm going to give her an opportunity to speak. To first, each of them will have the first opportunity to speak to that. And then we will uh, move into some other discussion. And maybe if Jeff, you want to jump in and help me with that a little bit at any time as we compare them, uh, I would appreciate that also. So, uh, Board Member Gravett, would you please give us a, an introduction to your uh, resolution? Yeah, and thank you, Vice Chair. And stop me if I go on too long. I just I kind of want to explain my rationale. And um, again, feel free to jump in and say, oh, your time's up. But I was thinking about um, this resolution. I was thinking about what this is a vote for. And, and I can't help but personalize it as a teacher and some of the experiences I've had. But um, for me, it's a resolution to do better. It's not the status quo. Um, it's a resolution to be better. 
it's a resolution not to bring anyone down, but to lift everyone up through access, through opportunities and awareness of our own implicit biases. It's a resolution that sends a strong message to our students of color that they matter, that their successes matter, that their voices matter, and they are worth being heard. They are not invisible. Um, and it's a resolution that aligns our mission statement of the State Board for creating equitable conditions for student access. When you look at the whereas statements, and some of those were brought up in public comment, you're going to see whether intentional or not, we have work to do in our schools. Um, when you have students of color only making up 25% of our student population, and yet they make up 41% of our suspensions and 51% of our expulsions, that's not okay. And you can kind of go through those whereas statements to kind of give evidence for why our job, why we are here today, why this falls on us to rise to the occasion. And I guess I wanna make sure it's brought up because I think there's some confusion. This resolution is not about bringing others down. It's not about bringing others down to somebody else's level. It's about lifting everyone up. It's about putting all hands in the middle and saying, we all belong here. Now. Some of the things I want to address, I've had a lot of emails telling me that racism doesn't exist. And I even had one telling me to get into the classroom and see for myself. And, and you guys know this, but I am in the classroom and I do see for myself. And I cannot tell you every day, and I've had some really hard experiences this year um, as I've read some really uncomfortable for me words that have challenged me as a teacher. Um, I don't, I don't claim to be racist and I don't wanna be, but I know that I have racist behaviors inside me that I have to examine every day that I don't mean to. And I welcome that learning. Um, sometimes um, as an education community, we sometimes ignore whether intentional or not the perspectives, the needs, um, the voices of students of color for so long that their actual needs, feelings and experience are sometimes not acknowledged. I had a student tell me um, that she stopped talking uh, about some of the racist behaviors that happen because nothing ever changes. Um, well, I'll tell you some things that happen. Students are hearing racial slurs in the classroom every day. Um, students hear things like, hey, if we turn out the lights, we won't see so-and-so. They say they are jokes, but they are not jokes. They are hurting our students. Uh, students are hearing monkey sounds. Um, it's not okay. There is racism going on and not intentionally necessarily, like I said, but we have so much work to do. Um, we have a system in my school that monitors the Chromebooks and the Chromebooks for what the messages are. It's called Bark. And I was talking to my principal about this. And just last week, we had 68 notifications for racial slurs, um, for hate speech. And this is just in one school in one week. And it's not okay. Um, and that's why I believe a resolution needs to lead to action. We have to have the resolve part. And board member Thorpe kind of mentioned that, but I just, in ending, I wanna just say those things. We need to resolve to condemn in the strongest possible terms, racism, hate speech, hate crimes, violence in the service of hatred. Hatred. We need to resolve to reflect and examine. There is nothing scary about reflecting and examining um, and having courageous com conversations. It's hard and it's uncomfortable and scary, but it's not going to hurt us. Um, we do resolve to offer training to board members to identify our own implicit biases. We do resolve to require training for state employees and contractors working with the Department of Ed. We do resolve to examine current academic standards. We do resolve to ensure state administered tests are free of racial bias. We do resolve to recommend that Utah school districts and charters reflect and examine policies. And we do resolve to support those things. Now, as I'm trying to listen to both sides, I really am trying to listen with empathy to those who do not want this resolution, and I'm trying to understand the fear, I really am, but in full transparency, my empathy is overwhelmed by the empathy I feel for my students, for my students of color, and I see the resolutions not as scary or dangerous, but as a way to shout to cheer in the strongest way possible that listening to voices that are often marginalized or silenced is a good thing. It brings about nuance, endurance, creativity, beauty, innovation, and power to the table. And I want us to be brave because these numbers, this data that we see, those are real students. And I can't forget that. And I hope you guys will see the need to actually take a strong stand and to not just maintain the status quo. Thank you, Vice Chair Marsh.
Thank you. I uh, appreciate your insights to your resolution so that we can understand a little better your thought process that way. I'm going to now turn the time over to uh, board member Jenny Earl uh, for her to speak to her resolution that she has uh, brought forth towards us and give her uh, a few minutes to talk about her. So Jenny, if you want to take the floor, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I do have just a question for Patty. Patty, we we probably need to actually make a motion to consider this, don't we? And not that we need to do that now. I can speak to this and then we can do that motion. I just, that actually was what the board requested and that's what we sent back to do. So before we actually do this, don't we actually have to vote on considering it? Would that be accurate or not? That is true. I think the motion was to consider this. So the first motion would be, thank you, board member Earl. Okay, would, so it, which is fine. We can consider this. Minute. Yeah, thank you, yes. But I think before, yeah, to just get make sure we're yes. in the framework. So, so originally, I sent out language very similar. Um, well, and it, as you can tell, and you've read through them, that the, the language is similar in some ways um, to leadership, and just said I, you know, I was interested in putting this forward. And as I talked to more and more people, um, it was clear that there needed to be a direction to go and not just the denouncing of something. And so um, the resolution in support of uh, liberty of individual students and their families in Utah schools, this is where we need to be putting our support is to in, that individual instead of, um, instead of just into groups, but finding what that individual needs. And that's, that's where the focus I come from. I'm trying to come from a, a very positive direction so that it benefits all students um, specifically, there's a couple things that are a little different between the two. Um, the whereas individual has the liberty interest best supported by the rights of a free exercise of conscious, conscience, protection of life, support of family, and to assist in developing each student's unique potential. That's what, that's what the State Board of Education, that's what we are we're seeking for, that personalized education, to really find where we can support one another and where we can support kids. And I so appreciate all the comments that have been that have been made. Um, and especially, um, I, I appreciate board member Newell's comments of saying, let's find what works, right? Let's find the direction we need to go and what needs to what we need to support one another. Um, I appreciated his comments and his thoughts and others, but that that stood out to me. I I, I just grateful for his comments. Um, just as we go down through here, um, I know Patty said that there's a there's this framework that's going on behind the scenes um, that's being built, and I think there needs to be some vetting maybe of that dialogue. I've I've included um, a definition of racism here because this is what people are familiar with, and it's it's something that we are. Um, that I think most people would agree that this it takes that this well obviously it's taking place we're seeing it here and there take place and we're seeing the concerns with it but the the reason why I included this in here is so that we have a very specific goal it's not just a system it's not just a widespread dialogue that we're not sure about how to hone into things that we can be very specific this is taking place and this is how it's happening and we're not going to we don't want to we don't want to um, encourage that. Um, let me see what else here. And then just under the, the whereas is that st stance that's been asked to be that we've been asked to take, which is a, a firm stance on denouncing racism. We don't tolerate tolerate it anywhere within our systems. And I tried to keep this simple. And the reason why I did that is so that it was easy to read, easy to understand and easy to move forward on. Um, using the very the very items that come from the portrait of a graduate. Honesty, integrity, responsibility, hard work, resilience, lifelong learning, personal growth, service, respect. These are the things we want in our students. These are the things we want in our community. Um, when the portrait of a graduate was put together, it was actually taken out. We went out into the community and said, what are these characteristics that we need from our students that we value as a society? And so I think it's really important that those are contained in here so that we have a we have a um, we have a clear path as to how we're going to move forward. One last thing. 
I feel like I absolutely think we need to be doing something. So the something we need to do though, that's where the difference of opinion comes in. I think the direction we need to take is to, um, first, it needs to be unifying, not divisive or dividing. And I get concerned the more I see this, these breaking kids out into, or people out into these branches of things where people are put into an oppressed and oppressor. Um, it, anyways, that it's a concerning thing. There's a lot of theoretical ideology around that. And that's where the concerns come, come in. We need to uplift, we need to build unity, and we need to be civil. Um, and around those, we need to frame it around the laws that are in place so that we are, we are making sure that we're um, supporting one another. And I'll leave my comments at that. So thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, board member Earl. And you are completely correct that we do need to get a motion going in order to be able to discuss and debate this. I just wanted to give both of you an opportunity to speak to and introduce the resolutions that you guys wrote so that we could have an idea of where you were coming from and and so other uh, board members who are on our committee have an opportunity to to start internalizing and putting together their thoughts so um, Dr. Patty Norman if I could ask for your assistance a little bit I operate on a little smaller screen than you yes. would you be willing to check to see uh, who has hands up? For instance, I know that uh, Scott has a, a, his hand up and is the only one so far, but I have to scroll through them. If you'll just keep me so I'm fair and even to those in order of how they rose their hand, I would be much appreciative of that. But I will also at this time call on, um, on Scott Hanson. If uh, you would like to go ahead, Scott. Thank you, and I'll try and be brief. I know we have a lot of ground to cover. This is a, a big subject to uh, bite off, and, and hopefully we can make some, some good headway today and, and get at least pointed in a good direction. Um, first, um, I want to say that this is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and you might you know, ask, what does a middle-aged white guy in Utah know about racism? Um, but I spent um, several years, we lived uh, with my family, six years um, in Japan. And in uh, the little town that we lived in for a couple of those years, our kids were the only white kids in the school. So uh, we saw both the good and bad. We saw, had very great experiences with uh, folks who were willing to really embrace our kids and bring them in. Um, had some really terrible experiences when the kids were shunned or uh, not included. <laughs> Um, so we've dealt with that as a family. I um, also had an experience where we were uh, trying to have a baby over there and they wouldn't let us into the hospital um, because uh, we didn't fit the right uh, racial profile. Um, so really good, good things happened for us, but also some really tough ones. Um, and I feel for um, the kids here in Utah who are experiencing this every day. Um, when I looked at this, and we've dealt with this for a couple of uh, weeks now, there were actually some drafts of this that were floated around last month. I thought about, you know, what are we doing with this resolution? And I just jotted down um, what I think um, some of the criteria ought to be for the resolution. Um, first, I think a resolution in general ought to be concise. Um, we should strive for a page, maybe a page and a half uh, maximum, because one, people won't read more than that. And, and two, we ought to do the work to boil down our thoughts um, and get them into a format where um, they are distilled. Um, that means not so many words on the page and it'll take some thought and, and work to do that. Um, also, I think we need to recognize reality, um, recognize the current conditions that we have. Um, the document should be forward looking. Um, I don't, Think it's so valuable in this sort of a setting to spend a lot of time looking backward and saying um, this was wrong or too bad or you know try and put blame um, but more to recognize reality and then try to move forward um, the document ought to be unifying so it should be bringing us together um, it should be actionable so we should look at it and know as a board where we want to go um, it should be practical um, should avoid hot button or loaded terms and jargon. And I think we had some good comments about that from John 
Um, Robinson talked about that a little bit, but um, there's a lot going on in the uh, social media, the news, political scenes. Um, as much as possible, we should write this in plain English and we should avoid um, hot button kind of topics. Um, it should be an enduring document, and so it should be relevant um, going into the future. And with, with that in mind, and I'm very late coming to the party, I tried to take um, what I saw from um, our two Jennies, and I sure appreciate both of them for stepping into this and doing what they did. Um, I tried to take those documents and, and put those together a little bit with a little bit of my thought. Um, and I gave a draft to Jeff. I don't know if he can throw that up. Um, but I can at least let folks see that for a moment. Um, and Jeff, is that possible to share a screen just for a second? Yes, do you see it? Um, not yet. I can see my copy of it, but if it's up, I can talk through it a little bit. It's up, it's up. You see it? Okay. Yeah, it's up, it's up. Um, I think but, in, the first, in the first paragraphs, and you can cut me off anytime, Chair. I know time is valuable, and um, um, I don't want to take more than my share. But um, at first, the first paragraphs are really that recognition um, part of it. That, and I think those are common, uh, fairly common to both of the drafts, that we, we are saddened by recent events. There is a lot of turmoil going on. Um, racism and human rights are real issues in our society. Um, we recognize that we have moral and legal obligations. Um, and then just saying that racism in the past and the present is destructive. Um, I do need to say the title, I did make a change there, Resolution Denouncing Rac Racism and Embracing Equity in Utah Schools. I believe we need to hit racism and say that word and hit it head on, but I also believe that the focus should be on equity. Um, and that's my attempt to strike a balance there. Um, and then as we move through, I think it's important to recognize that we, we have our legislators and uh, board members before us have put laws and rules into place that recognize that equity is an important part of education. Uh, it's built into our system. We may, may not be following it the way we should. We may not be looking at this with the right lens all the time, but it's built into our system. And so those reminders that I believe first showed up in, in uh, Jenny Earle's drafts, uh, I think those are important to have here. And so I have the references to all the law. And then um, down to the bottom, um, whereas disparities in educational programs and outcomes for underserved groups, including students of color, exist in our current educational system. That's a recognition, I think, of some of the statistics that uh, Chair Gravitt put into hers. I'm a little reticent to include all those statistics right now because they won't be the same next year. They may get worse. I hope not. They may get better. Um, but I do think we need to recognize that there are disparities, both programmatic and in educational outcomes. We need to say that. Um, and I, I think, for me, that's a strong enough statement just to recognize those disparities do exist. And then um, also, the fact that uh, I think Dr. Norman talked about this, that racism um, doesn't have to be racist. Racism can be unconscious or unintentional. Um, and identifying it as an issue doesn't mean that the people involved are racist. Uh, just means that we need to fix that behavior. Um, then we talk about inclusion um, and resolve that we will denounce racism in any form in our schools and our education system and embrace principles of equity and justice for all. And toward the end of this, referring back to our portrait of a graduate, which I think really is our guiding document that promotes equity um, and helps us to see that every child is served properly. And then as a final statement, our actions will demonstrate our belief that we are better when we are together. So that's my attempt at striking some sort of a balance here. I, I think that we're all headed the same direction. We just need to get all our thoughts on one piece of paper and, and be able to move forward. So um, that would be my proposal. We're not ready for a motion yet. So thank you, Chair. And thank you for those comments and your consideration on that. Uh, as you can see, our board members who are in this committee are very well prepared always, and I appreciate that. 
um, I believe. Um, Vice Chair, that... uh, Janet Cannon is ready to speak. Okay, have... thank you. I will turn the time over to Janet Cannon, one of our uh, board members who uh, sits on our committee, Janet. Are you there, Jana? Gonna look and see if yes, I, I was you. telling you all about it and I was on mute. Pardon me. I'll bet it was, re I'll bet it was really good too, wasn't it's it? It's really good. <laughs> okay. So, all right, go uh, ahead. I would like to propose a motion to put on the table so that we can uh, go into further discussion on the items that have been presented to us. My motion is uh, I move the committee consider drafts of a resolution for the access recommendation <clears throat> that the board create a resolution denouncing racism that have been provided by members of this committee. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, all right, committee members, we have before us a motion uh, that has been presented. And that motion is that uh, Janet Canyon put that she moves that the committee consider drafts of the resolution to the access or to the resolutions of the access uh, recommendation that the board create a resolution denouncing racism that may have been provided uh, that have been provided, excuse me, by members of this committee. Um, is there any further discussion? If we got popping up. Uh, okay. No, seeing no hands raised. Am I correct there, Dr. Norman? Yes, sir. Okay. I would then. Uh, ask that uh, all of you uh, take a look at the motion that we have up on the screen and please vote at this time. Okay. That uh, looks like our voting is complete. That looks like it is unanimous. Uh, that motion passes. Okay, uh, is there any further discussion? Any other comments that anyone would like to make towards this at this time? Vice Chair Marsh, um, Access um, would yeah. was to speak to the resolutions as part of, um, as those that um, that put the resolution forward. And so chair um, of the committee of access committee, Roseanne, Roseanne is um, willing to speak to that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for making me aware of that. Rosanna, this is uh, an opportunity for you to speak and, and to uh, talk to us as a committee. So I turn the time over to you. Great, thank you, board member Marsh. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I, I just want to kind of just sum up um, maybe what our access committee uh, from, our, from a statement. Uh, so thank you for allowing the access committee to provide a statement regarding the proposed resolutions. We also appreciate the USBE board for considering our recommendations and taking this monumental step in addressing the first recommendation by creating a resolution. Um, as we move forward in unity with the desire to consider the unique needs of all our students, we thank the USBE board and staff for taking into consideration the recommendations proposed and making educational equity a priority. And so by drafting and adopting this resolution that states that Utah public education or Utah board um, and system leaders will not excuse racist behavior in our institutions of education, and that we send a clear and resounding message that we support all of our students. And we talk about workplace culture, the culture of our state, the culture of our school systems. And by creating this resolution, it takes action on how we want all of our students to feel included and involved. And they are important to us. For our historically and systemically marginalized students, this shows that we will not take racism lightly. A resolution from the board will set the tone for the rest of our school districts and charter schools to take action at the local LEA level. 
the importance of, of this resolution or a resolution by the USBE board denouncing racism is so crucial in the current climate of national and local discourse rooted in race relations and reconciliation. In order to eliminate racism, we must first acknowledge its existence as we are doing. Then we can commit to taking concrete steps to disrupting harm when we witness injustice. So I thank you all for taking this courageous step to empower and support our students. And I thank board member Gravit, I thank board member Earl um, for generating these documents and then board member Scott Hansen for, for um, generating these drafts. And so I thank all the board members here in this committee for addressing this. So thank you. Yes, thank you and thank you. Uh send your thanks to your committee for the work that they've done. It's an important part of, of how we operate and how we work and help makes us a better board so that we can actually realize the needs of all students. So thank you so much if you'll pass that on. I would appreciate that. Um, do we have any other board yep. members who'd like Earl. to speak to this? Board member Earl is candidate. Yeah. Earl. Okay. Board member Earl, go ahead. Hi, and I'm sorry for the lighting in this room. I'm at my parents' house and I feel like I'm in the dark in this and I can't figure out how to adjust it. So I apologize. So if you can't see me, my face is here somewhere. Um, just real quick, I just wanna tell the access committee that I appreciate their thoughtfulness. I, I have been on a journey for about two months and it's been a, um, I probably read more in the last two months than I've read in the last two years. And that's not including board meetings. Set, it, set that aside, the 1800 pages or whatever for that. But I, this has been a very, very thoughtful, deep learning. Um, and I appreciate that um, because I do think there is great value in uniting people. And there's great value in, um, in celebrating our uniqueness as individuals and as our, our home environments and our, our cultures. So I just wanted to say that real quick. And, and anyways, I actually wanna make a motion that we move um, board member Hansen's to work upon. Yeah, I feel like it, it, is a, it is a balanced approach and that um, I'd like to make the motion that we move his to work from if we wanna make any other additional changes. So that's my motion. Okay, thank you, Board Member Earl, for that. Uh, appreciate your efforts as you worked on the resolution as we have all thought about that. We have before us right now, committee members, a motion to move uh, Board Member Hansen's resolution forward to have as a starting point as we start to work towards uh, our final uh, part of that. So, um, is there any further discussion to that? Board member Gravit has her hand up. Okay, board member Gravit, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate board member Hansen for kind of bringing something workable together. I'm wondering if he would entertain a friendly amendment um, or maybe I could just ask him this question. I noticed that the word equitable future was taken out. That's something that is really, really important to me. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something that he would be willing to put back in. So it's not just a bright future, it's a bright and equitable future because that speaks to the data that we have. Um, could board member Hansen respond to that for me, please? Board member Hansen. Sure, um, and I, I know right where that is, Jenny. I think that's up at the beginning. Yeah, first paragraph. And I don't have any problem with that. I, uh, You guys were a lot more thoughtful and took a lot more time than I did. I had both of your works to, to play with and look at when I tried to put this together. And I think Go if on. you can see in the beginning, equity is a focus of this. And I don't think adding the word equity by brighter, I don't think that distracts at all from the main purpose of the document. So I'd certainly be happy to add that in and then we can go from there. I don't um, have any illusions that this is a finished document either. So I think that if we can use this as a starting point, that would be awesome. Right, I appreciate that. And, um, I, I just could couldn't I, read um, it. Yes, go ahead, member. Sorry, I just couldn't read it. I don't have a copy, so I just wanted it full screen so we could see it. Thank you. 
Okay, so I guess. Okay. Since I can... All right. All right. Um, maybe, Chair, just a point of privilege. If we could ask Jeff, I emailed that out to him. Maybe he could just email that to everyone, or I could do that from here, and then you could have a copy that you could put up on your screen um, to look at while he has it on the main screen. I don't know if that'll be easier. And if you could send a copy to me, I'll put it in backup so that it can be for everyone to see. And then Vice Chair, if I could have a follow-up. Um, Absolutely. Board member, grab it. Okay, if um, Jeff, if you'll scroll down to where, I wanna look at the resolutions again, um, because I think some of those were taken off and I, I guess I wanna ask um, Board Member Hansen if there was a reason why some were taken off and some were, and I'm just wondering if we could make that a little bit stronger. Um, like for example, let me see, further resolve that all our policies, programs, activities shall promote unity. Um, Board Member Hansen, could you speak to um, why certain resolutions were taken off um, of the eight that were listed? And are there any that you would be willing to put back in? Is, if that's okay, Vice Chair. Yes, that's okay. Uh, Board Member Hansen, do you have a reply? Yeah, maybe I can respond in this way. Um, I don't, I mean, we can go through each one, but if there are ones that need to come in, if this is our working document, can we proceed with this and just make motions on what we want to add and then proceed that way? I think it might be a quicker way to get to a finished document if okay. we wanted to approach it that way. And I'll be happy to explain my thinking if there was any good thinking on you know, each of those areas. So, um, but I, I think that might get us to the end quicker. Okay, well, if with that, um, then Chair, could I make a motion to amend by adding, I'll just do it one at a time and then. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I would like to amend and move that we resolve to add, we condemn in the strongest terms possible. So add that resolution, strongest terms possible, white supremacy, culture, hate speech, hate crimes, violence in the service of hatred. I, you'd have to pull up the language, but I would move that we add that language. We'll start with number one. I guess I could pull up the, hmm. um, Jeff could probably pull it up there. Okay, yes, there it is. I'll say it one more time. I move that we add the words, the State Board of Education condemns in the strongest possible terms, white supremacy, culture, hate speech, hate crimes, and violence in the service of hatred. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we have any further discussion to that motion? Um, I'll, I'll speak to that, Chair. Um, so um, the resolution as it stands, and, and you remember kind of my goals um, to be concise and to avoid um, politically charged buzzwords um, were two of those. Um, it says that we firmly denounce racism in any form. Um, I think that that covers those things. And I think there's a lot of baggage um, and, and maybe, maybe um, you feel those words need to be included, but I felt like Racism in any form covered those. And I, I wanted to avoid um, words that, that take people away from thinking about the document as a whole and make them focus on just a word uh, with whatever connotations that brings into their, their mind. So that's why I pulled those out. Okay, thank you. Uh, board member Hansen for the put. Uh, I gotta look through here, see if we've got any other hands up that would like to speak to the amendment to the main motion, which would be to reinstate um, the words that Jenny just put there, back down. Um, I'm not, have missed anybody, Dr. Norman? I, I yep. have, yep. <laughs> oh yes, a board member Earl. Sorry, thank you. Um, okay, board member Earl, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I'd speak against this as well. I do feel like just that, that the simplicity, we need to keep it simple and that, um, and that we do denounce racism in any form. I think the expansion of that terminology allows for that of any kind, because who knows next year we may have 
another catch term or another phrase that that falls falls underneath there. Um, and so keeping it to where we can adequately um, bite this off and, and really look at the issues, I think that's that's where we need to be. Thank you, board member Earl, for that. Any other um, committee members that would like to speak to this? There are no other hands. No other hands? All right, board members, we have uh, before us, and I've got hopefully, I'm going to ask Dr. Norman if she'll read that for me. I have, like I said, a smaller screen. Would you please read the words that uh, Jeff has changed there? Yes. So do you want me to read from the now, therefore, be it resolved or as stated uh, for graduate, we will show. Words that she added, I think, is what she has that's underlined there. That's the. Okay. Uh, the, and yes. yeah, further resolved, yes, the state yes. board okay. condemns. Yep. Yes. And be it further resolved, the state board condemns in the strongest possible terms white supremacy culture, hate speech, hate crimes, and violence in the service of hatred. Okay, having uh, read that out, uh, board members, at this time, please vote. Okay, look, I'm trying to find Janet. There you are. Okay, Janet's on there. All right, that um, vote fails uh, four to one. Our one no vote being uh, board member Gravit. She was the yes vote. Yes, she's, uh, she is our yes vote, sorry. I'm thinking in the opposite. Thank you for keeping me straight. Um, all right. Um, Board Member Gravit, you said you you had another amendment that you'd like to bring forward. Is that correct? Yes, um, I would like to, um, and before I make the amendment, I just want to speak to why I'm doing this. I was thinking about what Board Member Hansen said, like the goals of this should be, you know, to steer away from politically charged language, um, to keep it simple. But I think we need to add, like in my, in my viewpoint, we need to add that it should make a difference for our students and it should have some really quantifiable things that would have to happen. So with that, I would like to amend and add back the statement um, and be it further resolved that the starting point of our work in racial equity must be a reflection and internal examination whereby the board will look for ways to engage our members in open and courageous conversations on equity and inequity. And that's my motion. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to give um, Jeff a moment to get caught up. Um, board Member Earl's hand is up. Word each. Okay, Board Member Earl, go ahead. Let me let me see the language, if you can, real quick. I oh, I've got to move my thing. Just a second. Is there someone else to speak? If not, then I will, I I will speak to this. Give me just a second, though. I I've, I've got to close out my thing. Yeah, I think you have the floor. There's nobody else. Is there, Dr. Norman, that I could see? No, there's nobody else. Um, board Member Hansen has his hand up. Okay, Board Member Hansen, would you like to speak to that why uh, Board Member Earl gets her uh, screen put together? I'll do that. And I, um, maybe I'll ask again for point of privilege and kind of have a conversation with um, Chair Gravit and just ask him. Um, so there's a, a paragraph here, and I'm juggling. Um, these, but it, it states that um, <clears throat> all of our, be it further resolved, all of our policies, programs, and activities shall promote unity and civility. We commit to identify, examine <clears throat> issues of race and color and the effect they have on the education system and community and to understand and correct any inequities. Are, is your motion redund redundant or would that, would that whereas need to be modified somehow? 
or are we saying the same thing twice? Okay. Um, that's the first here result the on the bottom. That's the action that I thought was there. Um, yeah, I guess the disadvantage is we didn't get a chance to look at this beforehand, but um, you know what? I can um, pull back my amendment. I think that that does, it's a little bit redundant. And I think that that makes me feel better. So I'm okay to pull that amendment. And I, I sincerely apologize for the lateness of putting this through. Oh. I, I looked at both of these amendments and I've been trying to figure out how we might get to somewhere good. And, and finally, an hour before this started, I started typing um, rather than try to do something with the two that we had. So that's my, my fault that we're late, I'm late. Chair Marsh, Superintendent Dixon's hand is up. Okay, um, really quick before I give her the floor, I just wanted to remind you if you've watched the chat that, that uh, this document is now in your uh, back. So if you wanna refresh your um, civic clerk, it'll come up to where you can view it and see it, uh, the one that we're working on. Superintendent Dixon. Welcome to our meeting. Always good to have you with us. Um, go ahead. Thank, thank you so much. Um, this really feels like a historic moment. I agree with the members of the Access Committee, and I just want to share appreciation to them for the role that they play as an advisory group to you. Um, two quick things. I the the amendment actually was just taken off, so my this might be a moot point. But I think Board Member Gravitz. Um, amendment had more to do with you as a board where the uh, the paragraph above that board member Hansen uh, included was uh, it was about the education community and system and as I read um, board member Gravitz it says whereby the board will look for ways to engage our members so I assume that meant board members so it's having the open and courageous conversations on racism and inequity. And I'll just state that um, I'll try not, I'll try to be brief and Patty, you give me the sign if I'm going on. Um, you know, I, I started the work internally after the death of George Floyd and like the rest of the country, the rest of the world, I was so shaken by it. And so many people were putting out statements, beautifully written statements. My my colleagues across the country were putting out statements and I, I would write and rewrite and tear up and write and rewrite and nothing, nothing felt, um, it just didn't feel right to just put out a statement. I felt like I had to first stop and engage in personal reflection. And then as um, Jenny Earl so aptly stated, really do my own work. And then I had to look uh, what I was in charge of, and that's our office. So looking at how do our over 300 employees feel when they come to work? Do they feel safe? Do they feel that they can be an individual while they're doing the work of the board on behalf of students? Um, are there things in our workplace that are occurring that I'm unaware of? And so having a courageous conversation with our entire staff through an email that I sent, responses I got back, and then people coming to the table to say, we're willing to work on this with you, Superintendent Dixon. So I will tell you that having this crew committee has made all the difference. And it's helped me grow as an individual. It's helped our workplace be a safer place to work. Creating that vocabulary work for us just to use internally helps me understand what terms mean. And Patty and I can tell you, we've had to ask what terms mean um, you know, I'll just give you a simple example of sometimes I get forms and they'll ask me what pronoun I want to be known by. And I didn't understand that. I'm so grateful for staff members who helped me understand the perspective of why that's important to people. And now when I see somebody with pronouns, I have a deeper understanding. It doesn't mean that I feel like I need to identify my own pronouns, but now I understand. And that's why we developed that vocabulary list. It was so helpful. That's internal work to, to help me be a better leader and to help us have a workplace that's more inclusive and more diverse. So I just put that out there to say, um, as long as the board commits to not being afraid to have the kind of conversations we're having today. And I think that's the intention. And if you feel that 
um, board member Hansen, that your comment around recommit to identify and examine issues of race and color and the effect they have on the system and community. Uh, if there's a way that the board can hold themselves to having those same conversations. I think that's what I hear in both board member Grava and Access's recommendations. So I hope that helps clarify the difference that I see between the two and my own personal experience with uh, being willing to have the conversations and learning what I've done and what I can do differently. Now, I don't feel shamed uh, in any way. I feel chagrined by things I could have done better, but now I feel like I can move forward and, and be a better leader. So thank you for that time. Uh, I appreciate you indulging me. Thank you so much, Superintendent, for your comments. Always good to hear what you have to say. Uh, Board Member Earl, have you got your thoughts together and on your screen where you needed to have them? Uh, yeah, I just wondered if are we moving on or I I have a well I, I'm just I'm just back. You had a comment and you were going to get oh yeah, and I thought we were we were taking this off. Is that but not can, the case? can I change my mind and keep it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well. Um, so you're, you're good? <laughs> Member Marsh, I'm yeah. out of order again. I apologize, but this is a lot easier when we're sitting around the table um, and are able to you know, push the paper around and, and write on a whiteboard. Um, but if there's, um, I, I thought, when I put this together that we commit to identify and examine issues of race and color, that means the board. And that we will identify issues with ourselves, with the whole system and examine, I think means discuss, which is the word that was here, or engage in courageous conversations. If that needs to be beefed up with some other words to express that sentiment, um, Propose those as a motion, but that, that was the intent, is that we as a board commit to look for these kind of issues and to examine them, which I think is a strong word to you know figure out what's going on. So. Scott, I, this is Janet. I, I, as I listened to uh, Superintendent Dixon and there was some question about the we, I wondered if it would be stronger to say the Utah State Board of Education commits to identify and examine issues of race and color. Does that make it a stronger statement in your view? I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I think that's what the, the we's referring to in the paragraph above we state Utah State Board of Education, but adding it there, this is a very formal, resolutions are very formal um, documents and to state Utah State Board of Education all the way through is perfectly okay, I believe, in this sort of document. So if that makes it clear, I'm great. That could be a friendly amend amendment if no one, if no one else wants to go against that. Okay, uh, consider that a friendly amendment. I think that's a good okay. idea. We have a friendly amendment. Do we have do we have anyone who would like to speak at that? To bring it to a vote, or are we all good with that? We still have Earl and Grab it with their hands up. Okay. Um, board member Earl. Scott, I'm just wondering if, can you scroll up just a little bit, Jeff? Just a little bit. Right there. So um, I included. I, I did add, and I don't know if Scott intentionally left it off or if he just didn't notice it on mine, but uh, both the United States Constitution, Utah Constitution, and let me make sure, and civil rights laws is what I included there um, as it kind of an afterthought after I had originally written my first one. D is there a reason, is that okay if we add that? That's what I'm, I guess, amendment to add it there. So does that make sense, Jeff, where I'm asking for that? I don't know who's running the typing. Chair, Chair <laughs> Mark. Could you repeat that one more time? Yeah. So right after, so put a comma after the United States Constitution, a race and our, and then have Utah Constitution, and then a comma that says civil rights laws. Chair Marsh, I apologize. Uh, may I speak? Yes, no, go ahead. 
Um, I just want to, so that staff can be best prepared to support you guys while you're making these motions, want to um, ask, so I know board member Hanson asked that if we could make them one at a time and then agree on that motion and then move to the next one, that would be helpful for us to be able to track them in this document. Um, would that be agreeable to you, Chair, Chair Marsh? Yeah. So that would take us back so to- um, In order to do that, you're- Okay. Lee, let's go back to our original motion. I just let that get out of hand. You are correct. We're starting to move farther down the line without having addressed the, the original part. So if you would read that to us. Yes. And that's so, the motion that we have before so, us at the time. Okay. So the motion before us that was still, I think, on the table was, and be it further resolved, the starting point of our work in racial equity must be reflection and internal examination whereby the board will look for, ver for ways to engage our members in open and courageous conversations on racism and inequity. That's the motion that's on the table. I, I thought we, I, I thought that was what the state, Utah State Board of Education clarifying the we is who we identify to do those things that instead of being redundant, am I, did I miss something? I thought we already agreed to that, am I? Yeah, that's what I was seeking for clarification. So it's- Oh, okay. Chair, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so I, the vice chair, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Jeff. So the motion was by board member Gravit to add the highlighted language. And Janet Cannon, I assumed, made an amendment to that motion. And that is where I believe we are. Right, she, she made an amendment to the amendment to the motion, correct? Correct. Okay. So having two on the ta two amendments on the table at the time we've hit our limit. So let's vote on the amendment to the amendment to the main motion, which is uh, the friendly type of amendment that Janet Cannon asked for, putting in place of we the words the Utah State Board of Education. Any further discussion to that? Okay, seeing none. Board member who? Earl. Earl, okay. Board member Earl, go ahead. Sorry, I'm a, I guess I'm a little, I hadn't taken it down yet. I was a little confused what was happening where this was removed then put back in, I guess. Is that what happened? It, I, I was unclear on the place of that. We were going to just add the language up here. I didn't realize this had actually gotten put back in. So I'm seeking some clarification on that because it sounded like it was removed at one point. Okay, start. Um, actually, what it was was when Scott wrote that, he started out in the first paragraph with the first or second paragraph with the State Board of Education. And then from there on out, as he worked through the resolution, it was we. And we just wanted to, Janet Cannon wanted to clarify that we is the Utah State Board of Education. And so uh, in order to have the we designated right there, um, she would like to have that put in everywhere that it says so that they know who is making the statement and who's making uh, this resolution. That's basically what it amounts to, exchanging we for the Utah State Board of Education. Does yeah, that answer your question? Yeah, well, I understand that part. It, it was, this was removed, this amendment was removed. I was just seeking clarification on that because I didn't, I thought the one, we were doing the friendly amendment in place of this, but I, maybe I misunderstood. So we can vote on, we can vote on the amendment to the amendment, I guess. Is that, Scott, is that the way you understand? Yeah. I think we're just voting on the replacement of we um, with the Utah State Board of Education. And then after that, um, we have the other motion that was still pending um, on this other language. Is that right? Okay, thank you. That is correct. That is correct. So go ahead and vote um, on the motion before us, which is the amendment, the amendment, the main motion, which is putting the Utah State Board of Education in place of we throughout the document.
Okay, that motion passes. It is unanimous. That will change that wording right there. Now we will go back to the amendment to the main motion. And if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where Jeff's got it highlighted down there. Um, would you read that for us, Dr. Norman? Yes. Please. Um, the main motion was, and be it further resolved, that the starting point of our work in racial equity must be re um, must be a reflection and an internal examination whereby the board will look for ways to engage our members in open and courageous conversations on racism and inequity. It also looks like we have a board member Gravitt's hand up. Okay, board member Gravitt. Um, Actually, my hand wasn't up, but I did leave my vote up. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? All right, board members, vote on the motion that is uh, before us at this time. Okay, it looks like that motion passes. Our yes votes, our board member Marsh, board member Gravit, and board member Cannon. No votes would be board member Earl and board member Hanson. You got that, Norley? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Um, okay, any further discussion on what we're doing today? Board Member Hanson has his hand up. Okay, Board Member Hanson. Thank you. Um, just wondering again, talking to Chair Gravitt, um, if there's a way to combine um, that addition that we just made with the paragraph above, just to clean this up a little bit, um, where it says that the Board of Education commits to identify, can we combine the, the extra meaning that needs to come from this statement to say, uh, or is this a standalone? I guess that's my question. Are they totally separate or could they be combined or should they be combined? That's a, now that's a, that's a part of an opinion, a personal opinion, like you could do it either way. I think it's more what the body of the committee would like to do. You'd like to see those combined in or if they'd like to keep them separate. Do I have a motion towards that? I'm, I'm fine to keep them separate. I was just asking um, our English teacher and chairperson <laughs> whether that made <laughs> sense. <laughs> because I'd like to respond to as clean of a document as possible in the end. So if they're separate ideas, they should be separate. If they're the same idea, they should be in the same um, therefore clause. Chair Gravit, what do you have to say to that? I am fine with it being combined somehow. That's um, That would be completely fine with me. But I really, I feel like the wording is very important. The courageous conversations are very important to me. Um, I think that pushes it a little. So I would like the wording, but I'm fine with a, a kind of combination because I think like Scott said before, this is sort of a work in progress and would need some cleaning up, but we're just getting the gist of what we want. So that, those are my feelings. Thank you. Perfect, absolutely. If you'll look up there at your paper, that uh, Jeff has displayed there. He's moved it up. He's doing a little bit of shuffling, I think, to wordsmith it to make it look better. So if you have some type of uh, direction for him that you'd like to see happening in case he's taken something out that you didn't want, um, please feel free to speak. And we'll give him just a minute to work through that. Do we have anybody else that has their hand up? I, I could make a motion, Chair. Um just with that combination. 
Um, okay. After Go ahead. correct any after correct any iniquities, um, semicolon and recognizes that the starting point of this work must be a reflection. So just and recognizes that. See if that gets us close. And I will defer again to the English teachers on punctuation, but. <laughs> You put a lot of pressure on Jeff. <laughs> All right. How does that look? Does that look how you wanted it, uh, Board Member Hansen? Sorry. We should capitalize the B on board, I think. But other than that, I think that looks great. That's, that's my motion, is that we... Uh, edit the uh, the draft to read as is shown on the board. Okay. All right, uh, board members, we have a motion before us and that is that we um, edit the draft done up here for us on our board, but uh, shuffle the words around and have in there and recognizes the starting that the starting point of the work of racial equity must be a reflection and internal examination whereby the board will look for ways to engage our members uh, in open and courageous conversations on racism and inequality inequity sorry any further discussion inequity period Board Member Earl's hand is up. Board Member Earl. Okay, so I did have that, that comment about adding civil rights laws. As Scott, is there any reason why you felt like that was not necessary or was just that not noticed or whatever? Do you have a comment on do that? We, do we want to vote on this one first and then we can vote on the next one to add in? I did think we not yes, vote? That was Okay. okay. No, we have not voted on this one yet. Okay. I, I'm just okay. giving you a chance. Yeah, you're right. Let's finish it. So okay. sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were done again, but yep. sorry. sorry. No, That's okay. Giving you an opportunity to speak to the motion that we're working on right now. Do uh, you want to speak to that or do you want to hold off and, and uh, have another motion after? Board member Earl, would you like to speak? speak to the motion that we have or would you like to wait? Yeah, I just think it, I think we're starting to add quite a bit of redundancy to things here um, and some ambiguity to the language, but um, that, that's my opinion. Okay, any other comments or concerns on where we're at? All right, seeing none, we will vote on the addition uh, to that motion that we were talking about. Board members, please vote. Jeff, during that time, there was um, a period at the end of inequity where you have a semicolon. All right, board members, that looks like that uh, motion passes. Uh, three to one. Um, our yes votes are Cannon, Gravit, and Marsh. Our no vote is uh, Earl. Okay, Angie Stallings is saying in the chat she thinks the semicolon needs to stay. Um, Anybody have anything to help us out on whether it should or shouldn't? I think it, it's, um, Chair, may I say something? I know it's a ticky, yes. thank you. I know it's a ticky tacky thing, but it's, if you're saying be it further resolved and then you want that paragraph as well as, as stated in our portrait of the graduate, um, you should probably be consistent, main, or either be consistent throughout using semicolons or consistent with periods. But I'm, 
looking now and it looks like there are periods in some places and in, in semicolons. So maybe I shouldn't have said anything. I just think you need to be consistent. Um, Chair, Chair Marsh, perhaps at the yeah. end, um, we could state that uh, we could make any grammar or punctuation changes and note them so that whatever happens, it can be forwarded to the full board so that we don't have to worry about those as we move forward this time. And then we'll have, we can look over it with those technical eyes of what needs to be changed if that's appropriate for you. I think that'd be much better for us today because we do have you guys kind of uh, touch up the rough edges when we get done. So I think that's uh, good as long as we have no uh, opposition to that. I would say we'll save that to the end. So thank you. All right, board members. Any further discussion on the resolution that we're writing? Board Member Gravit. Hi again. Um, I would like to move to add the word ethnicity. I would like to make an amendment to add the word ethnicity after the word race. So it would read the Utah State Board of Education commits to identify and examine issues of race, comma, ethnicity, and color. Okay, Jeffrey is getting it put up there for us. We have a motion before us to add, add ethnicity in that paragraph right there behind race so that it reads race, comma, ethnicity, comma, and color. Is there any further discussion to that amendment? Board Member Earl has her hand up. Okay, Board Member Earl, go ahead. I I had my hand up for the previous amendment that I had made, but we'll, I, I guess whatever we want to do here <laughs> at some point, wait, at some point, let me know what <laughs> I can make that amendment. I thought it would have been now, but um, maybe I was wrong. Um, sorry, yeah. yeah. No, you, you are good. Uh, just looking to make sure the chat was there. Um, that's my fault. I should have looked. I'm, like I said, I'm scrolling through a smaller screen, so I didn't pick that up, but your hand was a spill up from the yeah, that's original the one there. So if we can move on to this, and then I'll come back to you, okay? Sounds like a fair deal. I, I'll agree to that. Um, board okay. Member Hansen has his hand up. Hansen. Okay, Board Member Hansen. Just a question for those who wrote our lexicon who put the dictionary together. Explain to me the nuances, um, why race doesn't cover that. I'm fine with adding it. I just, how does, how does it help us or how does it expand the definition race on race and ethnicity? That's a good question. And can any of you answer that one on the? So this is Deputy Superintendent. I'd like to ask if Rosanna could um, answer that question through access to eyes. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Deputy um, Superintendent Rosanna, uh, can you clarify for us, please? Sure. Um, and I, I will also have uh, Dr. Klesina Mahan Reynolds, but ethnicity speaks to someone's ethnic identity. And I and Dr. Klesina Mahan Reynolds will also further provide details about this. Okay. Hi, thank you, Rosanna. Yeah. Um, so when we're when we're talking about um, ethnicity, and it's actually also put in the chat, it is the term used in federal legislation, and it does cover um, how someone identifies with their ethnicity, not just their race. Usually, when we look at race, we're looking at um, the federally recognized, right? Um, racial. You know, we're looking at black, white, indigenous, um, and Native American. Pacific Islander, Asian, ethnicity is also um, how someone identifies. So that is just more inclusive language. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. So board Member Hanson, does that fit in with what you're trying to do? Yeah, no, that helps. I just demonstrate my ignorance, I guess, on how all that plays together, but I appreciate that and I'm fine with the amendment. 
Okay, I, I joined your group because I was kind of scratching my head a little bit there myself. All right. Can, board this member. is Board Member Cannon. Can I make a comment on this? Yes. I actually prefer the term ethnicity. I think it's it's more specific to to people, whereas race is something that is uh, something that we evaluate by just what we see, and we don't really take into uh, consideration an individual person like ethnicity would. Uh, I believe the 2020 census set an example of this where we no longer record the race of individuals on the census, we re but we do record their ethnicity. So I think ethnicity is a better way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. Board Member Earl, back to you. I forgot you. Here's your chance to shine. Yay. We still haven't voted on that, so. Oh. <laughs> Just no, kidding. Sorry about that. Well, I, I keep looking up on my clock and it's 5.30 hey. and I'm trying to push, so we'll, we'll go I'm back. Let me get I, need, I, can, I can work around it. <laughs> okay. All right, board members, we have uh, the change that we you see up on the board where we've added the ethnicity into that sentence structure all those uh, who are ready to vote place your vote <laughs> all right that looks like that vote is unanimous it passes now, board member Earl. Thank you. So um, I think, Jeff, do you have it? <laughs> do you want me to repeat it? I, I just wondered about, I, I feel like that is an important part of that ending that sentence there. Do you remember what that was? Um, I heard the question before. This is about the uh, elimination of civil rights law that was in there. Yeah. Did you and I was working from a draft that, that we had before the I started previous one. Okay. Would it is draft um, that I think we saw last month. So there was yeah. no intentional taking that out. I think that civil rights law actually adds a lot yeah. in this regard to the constitution of both the state and the country. Um it's it probably is important to have that in there. Yeah, I feel like it is very important actually. And that was something that one of the groups I reached out to that they indicated that as well. So. so are we are we doing that in place of our Utah Constitution? No, 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 no. So no, it's no. comma after United States Constitution, comma. Utah Constitution, comma. Well, our comma, I don't know whether we put the comma in there or not. And civil rights laws. Perfect. Let me see. Yep. And we're taking that sure. as an amendment, correctly? Yes, please. Okay. Give Jeff just a second to get it up there. Everybody have a chance to look at it and see the changes that he's making there. Hopefully. Okay. We have before us the changes um, on the paragraph that Jeff has up on the board. We've added and civil rights laws on the end changing the comma behind US, the United States Constitution, comma, Utah Constitution, comma, and civil rights laws, period. So any further discussion on that, board members? There are no hands. Seeing none. No hands, okay. Seeing none. Oh. Okay, board members, that passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Um, Chair Gravett, our fearless leader, we are at 5.30, 5.33 to be exact. Um, would you like to continue on with this 
and go into the midnight hours or should we table this and put this into next month for some more work do you think we should not table it in my opinion because <laughs> i won't be here um i don't know how other committee members feel but i think i think we're getting close i i feel it anyway i think we could probably finish this and then we could prioritize what we need to do for the rest of the meeting and depending on i don't know uh, what people's time schedules are but um i can stay as long as we need to so i don't know chair do you, are you okay with finishing this item and then we'll make a decision after this sure okay. i am good with that so any are there any other additions amendments are we good with how it is right now the resolution that we've been working on so we can go back to the main motion which would be accepting this resolution as it is written we have any comments Earl and Gravit with a hand up. Okay, Board Member Earl. Yes, I'm trying to figure out where to put this in so maybe you guys can help me. I do feel like it's important to um, include develop something about assisting in developing each student's unique potential. Um, I just feel like that's that is an important part of um, of this and I'm trying to figure out exactly where to include that that so I, I it's a little tricky going back and forth between the two documents on my page so if someone has a suggestion I would be open to that so um could you could you please repeat that really fast for me oh. yeah let me go let me go back uh it is just the to assist in developing each student's unique potential. I just think include, and, and I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to go back and forth, trying to figure out the best location for that. I, it would have to be under somewhere where the responsibility of schools or um, the board, not. Could, under, it, could, it, could you do something with paragraph two right at the top? Organization. Oh. We're recognizing our obligations to educate yeah. you and to help them to achieve their unique potential or whatever those words. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good spot. Um, to assist in developing each student's unique potential. That's the wording, but it, it could be adjusted a little bit. So let's do let's do that. Where that and is there. So our youth. Uh, Jeff, are you with us? Yeah, you're with us. Do you want me to read it off? Uh, we can, and then we can work with the right. words. Do you want me to read it? Um, to assist in developing each student's unique potential. Now, let me read it and make sure if we need to tidy it up a little. So maybe it it does maybe need to be a comma there right after youth. So comma to assist in developing each student's unique potential, comma. Does that work? And guided though, does that transition very good? Yeah, yeah. And guided by the framework of laws and administrative rules of the state of Utah. Okay. I'm open for thoughts about that. Okay, uh, that's an official amendment then. Yes, please. Okay, all right. We have proposed as an amendment um, that we up in paragraph two have the addition to that paragraph that says to assist in developing each student's unique potential coming right after uh, educating our youth. Is there any further discussion to that amendment? Board member Earl, hands up. Okay, board member Earl, you wanna to speak to your uh, amendment, yeah. please? I, I just, I feel like this is a, a, a 
a key thing, if we're removing some of the other language from mine um, that I, I, I felt needed to be there about the individual and supporting the individual, I feel like this is a this is a compromise in that to assist in developing each student's unique potential because that is really, that is our mission and that's where we're going, uh, not just with portrait of a graduate, but also with um, the individualized learning is to help them meeting their uniqueness and to um, succeed in doing that. So. Okay. Thank you. Other board members. Just to comment on the specific wording, um, should we be looking at in recognizing our moral and legal obligations in educating our youth and assisting in developing each student's unique potential? And then, and guided by, is, does this read properly? Should it be? Recognize, yeah, we could do it like that too without the end, recognizing our moral and legal obligations and educating our youth, assisting in developing each student's unique potential. It's really two parts to the sentence that needs to be broken up because our obligations are all the way to potential. And then after that, we're guided by the framework of the laws and administrative rules. So do we need an and and a semicolon or how do we fix that? I guess punctuation will leave to staff, but somehow that needs to be dressed up a little bit. Member Gravitt, do you have a little help for us? You know, I think, I mean, just looking at it from a grammatical point of view, and I, I trust that staff could do this, I think you could make it um, parallel, like, because you've got that educating our youth, you've got each student's unique potential. I feel like you could combine it and get the word youth out of there and just have educating our students, et cetera. Like, I feel like you could combine that. And I trust staff to make that consistent. Um, I mean, unless people want to wordsmith now. Uh, are, we, are we good with that, board members? I just wondered would it help to add the word being guided by the framework of the laws and administrative rules? I think that makes a little more sense. Yeah, I think that, that works better for me too. Thanks, Janet. Janet, that's the verb I was trying to find. Thank you. <laughs> she was holding out on you, Jeff. Okay, are we, are we good with how that looks, I'll Board Member Hanson? One, I'll give this one quick try and then I'll let the staff go from there. How about recognizing our moral and legal obligations to educate our youth, comma, assist in developing each student's unique potential, or and, sorry, and assist in developing each student's unique potential and being guided by the framework of laws. Does that clean it up? Yeah. Are we good with that, board members? Yes. Okay, board member Gravit, what do you think? Oh, I'm okay with that. I mean, I just put something in the chat, but I was just scrambling, recognizing our moral and legal obligations to educate our students as we assist in developing their legal potential. I just, this is just a grammatical thing. I don't really like the word youth. It feels like a, I don't know, it just, I just like the word students. <laughs> That's that's just a silly thing, and I can live with whatever. Okay. All right. Can we just, are going. Oh, Mark, go just ahead. read what Jenny Gravit has real quick. Just if, it was just a quick thing I put in the box. It's changing the view to students. Recognizing our moral and legal obligations to educate our students as we assist in developing their unique potential, et cetera. Okay, well, I guess either way, right? I, I do, I think, I think, I think yours is flowing a little bit better. I'm sorry, I clicked on the chat and as soon as I did my mute, because I read it to myself, it came up right in front of the wording. So I had to wait for it to go off. <laughs> okay. I was speaking to myself. <laughs> Happens all the time. 
board member Gravett, um, just for Jeff so that he can make that change. You stated to educate our students, and then you didn't say and, to educate our students. I put, and I put it in the chat, as we assist in developing their unique potential. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I feel like that. Okay, we have a couple more comments in the chat that we might want to look at. Yeah, Superintendent Dixon put one in there, a couple of them actually. Scott, can you speak to yours exactly what you're thinking? I was thinking if we have too many ands, we can say while being guided by the laws and administrative rules. So if we're getting tired of saying and so much, we could put while in there. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that clears that up. Uh, Brian has in there the framework of is extraneous. Literary people, does that change your mind on how we're putting it together? It's in the chat box, sorry. I think he's right. We could just delete um, the framework of being guided by the laws and administrative rules of the state of Utah. I think we're getting a lot of agrees. So I think that would be, what about that then, uh, board member Earl, does that change fit? Let me just quickly read it one more time. I think we're there, are getting really close. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that works. I think that works. Okay. All right. Any further discussions on this amendment to the main motion? Seeing none, board members, please vote. All right, board members, it looks like that vote is unanimous. We've come to a consensus on that. Do we have any further items that we would like to uh, see there. Superintendent Dixon's asking for someone to look at or address possibly the phrase of brighter and equitable for parallel languages. You want me to address that? Maybe it's just my little uh, bug, but oh. yeah, it's, it's been bugging me. Well, either bright and equitable or uh, bright and more brighter and more equitable. I like bright and equitable. Because if we're bleak right now and it just gets a little brighter, that doesn't help much. So bright and equitable is, um, to me, a much better goal. Is that a motion? I can't make a motion. I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, like, <laughs> we're having a historic moment. Come on. <laughs> I think that's a grammatical fix, and I think we should go ahead with bright and equitable. I, I just need to let the committee know we need to probably finish this by before six i i really have a crunch at six so i'm just okay you know. we're, we're at 5 47 staff has has put in the chat box there that uh, the other stuff is not time sensitive so we would technically have about another 12 minutes 13 minutes to go if you'd want to carry on okay any anything Next change, if we need any, and if not, we'll vote on the main motion. Board Member Gravett has her hand Yes, up. Board Member Gravett, go ahead. Hopefully this is a simple one, and then after this, I just have one more. But um, on the second page, um, it says, whereas, let me find it again, whereas racism, oh gosh, I just lost it. Second page at the top, whereas racism can be unconscious or unintentional, I would move that we remove the word unconscious. And so it just would say, whereas racism can be unintentional. Okay, that's an amendment officially. Board member Gravett, that's an official amendment then. 
or we weren't uh, smithing? Well, I, I don't know. I think we probably have to vote on it since I'm taking out a yeah. contact here, but I'm okay if it's just for Matt, if Scott's okay, okay with it, friendly. Let's, uh, I'm, I'm let's here trying to think about what the really is the difference um, between unconscious and unintentional. So um, I'm trying to think what we're removing from that by taking out unconscious. Uh, you know, the meaning I think is clear to everyone. It means people don't have to be racist and intend to make racist actions. Sometimes things happen that just aren't equitable and aren't good. Um, and we we haven't, there's no intent behind it. Mm -hmm. So that that's the reason the unconscious and uh, unintentional are there, but maybe maybe we don't need unconscious. I don't know. I, I, could, see your, I, could, see your, I could see your point there though. Because you consciously could make a choice to be that, um, but un but intent. I guess you could be intentional also. I'd like to hear Janet weigh right, in on that, it. That, She's that, a oh. yeah. there. You go, Janet. What do you say? I I think we can delete unconscious, or I think they're they're basically the same idea. It, in my mind, anyway. I think All right. Do we need to make that an official amendment, or can we just do that as a friendly amendment wordsmithing? What do you guys want to do? I guess we got to change it. It's changing oh, what just we do have an, on there. Just do an amendment real quick. We'll just vote. It's, I think. Okay. All right. The amendment is, is that we change that, take out the words unconscious or, and leave it in that paragraph as whereas racism can be unintentional. Uh, board members, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please vote. Sorry, Chair, or excuse yeah. me, Vice Chair. I'm, I'm just, yeah. I punched a quick one in. I know this is not the way we should be doing this, but I punched it into my browser, just um, unconscious and unintentional. And unconscious bias is uh, different than unintentional racism, according to the internet and I'm trying to figure out how that difference is or what that difference is but um, this is just talking about unconscious biases affect all our relationships so I don't want to um, take out I guess a, a part of this that might be uh, important maybe one of our educators can help us or we can look into it or the access committee may have more insight into that but I, I think uh, this has been I don't even know if those are my words when they started. I think we've pushed this together from a lot of different um, places and it, that was intentional when someone put it together in the beginning. So could access maybe help us with unintentional versus um, um, unconscious? Rosanna or Clustina? So when we speak to um, something that is unintentional, we don't necessarily have the intent to do it, but it happens. When we speak to something that is unconscious, we speak about things that are going on um, within our world every day. And so we don't make a conscious act to do that. And so that's why it's important to keep unconscious and, and, and to keep unintentional in there because when we look at impact versus intent, we don't always mean, right? Our intent is as good as humans, right? But sometimes the impact, that's something that we feel or that we say that is either unconscious or unintentional, it has a certain um, impact. And so that's what we're looking at. And so that's why when you keep both of them in there, it covers um, everything, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. That does give us some clarity as to what you guys were thinking about as it was written. Um, so I guess we have uh, we have the amendment in front of us, and that is change out uh, unconscious or and leave it as whereas racism can be uh, unintentional. All those any further discussion on that? Seeing none, please vote. Um, 
I'm sorry, are we voting to put back unconscious? No, we're, vo we're voting to take that out. That was the original. Uh, oh, yes, that was you. the original uh, motion. It was a, an amendment. So, looking through. Looks like that motion fails. Uh, the no votes are um, board member Hanson and board member Cannon and board member Marsh. The yes votes are Gravit and Earl. Um, so that, that motion doesn't pass. It'll stay, whereas racism can be unconscious or unintentional. Okay, any further amendments or discussion to this matter? Board Member Earl and Gravit have their hand up. Okay, Board Member Earl, go ahead. Jenny, do you have another amendment? Did you say one more? I do, but you can go okay, ahead. Then first. we can make the, after that, we can make a motion because, like I said, I'm okay. getting here. <laughs> but go ahead. So board Member Gravit, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to just do this in one shot. So if you look at the last two resolved sections, I would really like to move to include those and I can read them. Um, but I'm sure Jeff could just put those up there. Um, it would read and be it further resolved that the State Board of Education strongly recommends that all Utah school districts and charter schools begin a reflection and internal examination of their own policies and practices involving all members of their school community to examine all facets of the school's operations with a special emphasis on <clears throat> curriculum, hiring practices, staff development practices, and do student discipline. Um, e.g. suspension, expulsion, and be it further resolved that the State Board of Education directs USBE staff to provide support for school districts and charter schools reflection and internal examination, including assistance with identifying and sharing curricular models and resources approved by the State Board, promoting sessions to allow districts to share and collaborate on their actions and to share progress in implementing these changes. I think without that, there's not there is not that push to let's actually do something in our schools. So that's my amendment. Okay. Thank you for that amendment. Do we have any discussion to that amendment? Remember Earl. Remember Earl, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just I feel like this just we're we're weighing this down. I feel like we've we've gotten to the roots of what we needed to get to. Um the other things that come along with that will be will be built into it. We've got the laws, we've got our rules, we've got um, all those things we're addressing up above. And I really feel like this weighs it weighs it down at the end instead of being the conciseness. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, Chair. Yes, Board Member Hanson, go ahead. I know you can't see the hands raised, I'm sure on your phone. Um, I, I'm going to speak against this one too. I, I think that we've already resolved that we're going to identify and examine issues of race through the education system and understand and correct any inequities. So I, I think that we should just stick with that. Um, and I, the part about the local school boards, um, I think that that's going to come as we look through our systems, and I believe that some of them are way ahead of us on as far as passing their resolutions. We just heard from Avis and what they're doing, um, so I'll speak against the just mostly for brevity. I think we need to keep this concise. Okay, thank you, Board Member Hanson. Board Member Grava, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to speak in favor of this again, because I understand brevity. In fact, one of my favorite words is parsimony, you know, keep things simple. But to me, um, we have, we've had the laws forever, but it's not making change. You look at those statistics and you have teachers of color, 91% are white. That's no different than when I went to school. So I just want to push us to say, no, we are going to resolve that this is an action we will take. We will examine the facets. We will look at hiring practices. It's stronger. Um, it's bolder. And, and it's so important. And so I would just urge you to, 
to um, maybe sacrifice some brevity for the sake of doing something really valuable um, in getting local education agencies to take a stronger look at what they're doing and examine and reflect. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Abbott. Um, any other discussion? Superintendent Dixon has her hand up. Okay, Superintendent, please. Oh, it's just a little ticky thing. Um, my staff and probably everyone out in the field knows that I uh, try to keep us with a language of professional learning versus staff development. Um, so that's just, just sort of a simple request. And then I, just in the chat uh, with a comment from Nicolene Peck, when we talk about representation of workforce, we are working as a state to try and provide uh, Students of students of color with teachers who are uh, either ethnic, more ethnically diverse, uh, race more akin to them. We're all teachers, but we have a workforce that looks very different in many places than the students they serve. And there's a lot of research supporting um, supporting backing up the notion that when we have a workforce that mirrors the students that they serve, that students. Um, see role models that are akin to them, and there are a lot of other benefits. So um, we're not speaking poorly of teachers or um, teachers who are not teachers of color, but it is both a national and a statewide trend that we're trying to overcome in not having teachers of color in our classrooms. And, and for us, examining policies like why aren't we rec recruiting teachers of color into our classrooms? And when we get them, why are we not retaining them? Why don't we see more uh, persons of color in leadership positions in our schools, et cetera. So it's something we've been working on for a long time. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Any further discussion? Check for hands. Sue, got me where. Um, I do board, have. Board member, who was first? Oh, go ahead, if there's someone else. Go ahead, board member Earl. Yeah, I, once again, I don't, I think we, we address those issues and to what Superintendent Dixon said. Um, and I'm trying to remember the organization. I just was trying to look back through my many notes here that from access committee of those that are building this out. I mean, I, we are definitely working that way. We are definitely um, assisting those that are interested in going into the teaching profession that are um, involved with different populations. And so, I, I think I'm just looking back down this programs, policies, curriculum. Um, I, I think we're I think we're there. Like I said, I think we there's no need to expand things out. I think we're redundant in doing that. So um, I just trying to I went back through to try to see if we missed that in here. We don't programs, policies, curriculum. So I I think we're there. Okay. Uh, who's our next hand board member? Or, yeah, board member Norman. You're gonna you're gonna get yourself a job. Uh, Superintendent <laughs> Norman. So, okay. Um, so Earls was the last, um, board member Earls was the last hand up. I do know that um, board member Newell wanted to have a, a point of privilege if he's still on here to speak to this, if it would be allowed by the chair. Sure. As a, as a member of the state board of education, I would accept that. Are you on board member Newell? He may have dropped off in the meantime. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking, not seeing him on through my little screen right here. No, I don't believe he's with us. Okay, we so can. Anyone, anyone else? Seeing none, we will vote on the amendment to the main motion, which was the last uh, addition that we had put on there by Board Member Gravett. Uh, it's up onto the screen. Board uh, Deputy Superintendent Norman, could you read that for us quickly, please? Yes, and be it further resolved that the State Board of Education strongly recommends that all Utah school districts and charter schools begin a reflection and internal examination of their own policies and practices involving all members of their school community to examine all facets of the school's operations with a special emphasis on curriculum, hiring practices, professional learning practices, and student discipline, e.g. suspension expulsion, 
and be it further resolved that the State Board of Education directs USBE staff to provide support for school districts and charter schools, reflection and internal examination, including assistance with identifying and sharing curricular models and resources approved by the State Board, promoting sessions to allow districts to share and collaborate on their actions and to share progress in implementing these changes. Okay, uh, uh, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent uh, Patty Norman has read that for us. Board members, please vote. Okay, according to the vote, it looks like that uh, motion, this uh, that amendment failed. Our no votes are Scott Hansen, Jenny Earl, and Mark Marsh. Our yes votes are Janet Cannon and Jenny Gravett. You got that, Nora Lee? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else that other board members would like to look at on this document? Board member Earl's hand is raised. Oh, it went back down. Well, we I we need to, yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we, we accept, um, I don't know what the term needs to be, we accept this resolution. Um, we, we have a, we have an, we have a motion. Our main motion was to accept Scott's thing. And then oh, we started to okay. amend it after. Okay. So I, whether we want to so the, the motion that we that. have before us right now would be that we uh, accept uh, the resolution presented to us by Scott Hansen with those changes that we have on the board at this time and and authorize staff to make grammatical changes and clean up the formatting Any further discussion to this motion? Seeing none, board members, please vote. Okay, board members, that passes. That looks like that was unanimous. And we will move that forward to uh, full board on the next meeting. Chair Gravett, I relinquish the chair back to your able hands after my hurried up version of a meeting today. Oh, Mark, you thank you so much for um, navigating through that. And um, it sounds like the rest of the actionable items can be moved um, to next month without me. But um, I just want to thank you guys one more time and take a point of personal privilege and just say, if you don't know, this is National Human Rights Month. And on the 10th is Human Rights Day, which also happens to be Emily Dickinson's birthday. But um, in honor of that, I just I'm so proud of you for this historic moment. I want to share one last thought by one of my heroes, Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, where, after all, do universal human rights begin in small places? close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. And I know each of you are gonna continue championing, 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 that's a hard word to say, such important change in small or um, other small but very so large spaces. And I thank you all for serving. Uh, thank you for being part of this committee, for continuing to serve, and for letting me be part of the journey. And you guys all know where to find me. Um, I'm usually in my classroom if I'm not talking to my mom or hiking with my wife or reading with my three cats and dog. And I just offer you so much love and gratitude and have a really great weekend, you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for all that you've done for us. Thanks, Jenny. Thank, thank you. you Jenny. Have a great weekend. Thanks.
It's been great to work with you. Thank you, you. too, guys. I'm going to miss you. Well done, Jenny. You will be missed. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you know where to find me. And board member Marsh as well. Thank you. Yes. Chair Gravit, I just have to tell you. Oh, she left. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for salvaging me, uh, Patty. <laughs> hey, Thanks, you Patty. did great. You did fabulous. This was.